I'm gonna wait for them to come back from the rest. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, today is May 9th, 2018. Welcome to the PVUSD school board meeting. Um, happy to see um, our visitors here with us um, this evening. We're going to go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and Trustee Acosta is going to lead us. Please rise. of the United States, States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. So again, I just wanted to welcome everybody, and we um, will go ahead and move move on to superintendent com comments. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to log in. If anybody here um, would like translation services, you can come over here, and we have um, equipment for you, so you can have a real time translation for the meeting. Thank you. Disculpa, en traducción tenemos a, a la señora Virginia que puede ayudar con eso, le puede otorgar un um, aparato para eso. Okay, so thank you. So today is Day of the Teacher and upcoming is Classified Week. So hoy es el Día del Maestro y próximamente será la Semana de Personal Clasificado. So on behalf of the Board of Trustees, Cabinet, and myself today, we celebrated our staff and the work that they do every day. Together, we prepare our students to reach their greatness. Their daily contribution to our district makes an impact on our students. Today, members of Expanded Cabinet, all over there, um, de hand delivered an assortment of delicious cookies to each site or department. So, en nombre de la mesa directiva del gabinete el mío, hoy celebramos de nuestro personal y el trabajo que hacen todos los días. Juntos todos preparamos a nuestros estudiantes para alcanzar grand grandeza. Su contribución diaria a nuestro distrito tiene un, un impacto en nuestros estudiantes. Hoy los miembros del Gabinete Extendido entregaron, entregaron personalmente una variedad de deliciosas galletas de cada sitio o departamento. So whatever you do every day, regardless of your role, it matters. Together, everything's possible. So cualquier cosa que hagan todos los días, independientemente de su papel, importa. Juntos, todo es posible. And on Monday, April 30, 30th, I had the great pleasure to spend the day in the life of an occupational therapist with Susan, Susan Ramos. I traveled with her as she went to three schools, Rio del Mar, Amesti, and Mar Vista. We saw individual students and students in small group. She showed such kindness and expertise with our students, ensuring that she met every student at their point of need. And so we're so fortunate to have Susan Ramos on our team. So el lunes 30 de abril, tuve el gran placer de pasar el día en la vida de un um, ter terapeuta um, ocupacional con Susan Ramos. Viajé con ella mientras visitaba a tres escuelas, Río del Mar, Amesti y Mar Vista. Vimos a estudiantes individuales y a estudiantes en grupos pequeños. Ella mostró tanto amabilidad y experiencia con nuestros estudiantes, asegurándose de conocer todas las necesidades de cada estudiante. Somos muy afortunados de tener a Susan Ramos en nuestro equipo. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, item 3.4 is student recognition. Um, I don't see a lot of people out there, so I'm hoping. Yeah, they're here. Okay, Bradley Elementary, Greer Hambly. 
everybody who's here to support you, Greer, bring them up. Congratulations. So Greer happens to be my sister's name too. It is not very common, so I was really pleased to see that there. Is this on? Yes. All right. You may have to lean in a little bit. Can you right side? Oh, I'm okay. I can just... Whoa! All right, thank you. All right, uh, good evening. My name is Brian Saxon. I'm the principal at Bradley. So uh, good evening, President DeRose, board members, and Superintendent Rodriguez. It's uh, my pleasure tonight to introduce to you Greer Hambly. So Greer's right here. Greer's a sixth grader at Bradley Elementary, and she embodies the spirit of Bradley. She is a young lady who is polite, respectful, always willing to help and try her best. She's supported by her mom and dad, Justin and Jen, who are here, and by her brothers, Declan and Callum, all Bradley graduates, well, almost. And Ms. Parker, her sixth grade teacher, is here as well. And so um, she's talked to me a little bit about what's, what she's gonna miss, what she's looking forward to, and as she moves on from Bradley, she's been there since second grade, uh, she said she's going to miss the teachers, um, especially Miss Parker. Um, she's going to miss the positive atmosphere that we have at Bradley. And she's really going to miss the library. Greer spends a lot of time in the library. She's a junior library league helper, uh, helps plan events in the library, hangs out there. Uh, you can pretty much find her all the time with a book in her hand. Um, continuing on to the junior high next year at Aptos Junior, she's going to... Uh, enjoy and she's looking forward to the variety of teachers right all right uh, the language art classes she's excited she got to test for accelerated so she's hoping to get in there and I know that she'll get along well with Megan Fuller the librarian up there who will probably take her under her wing and and use all of her excellent skills uh, in her spare time and this is pretty cool she plays the cello um, and we've heard her play in our talent show. She's very talented. Uh, she said that she enjoys playing classical jazz, and every once in a while she throws in a rock and roll cello song. <laughs> All right. She went to, what was it, the concert of the, the Avid Brothers? Avid. Avid Brothers, and said, what's that big thing that guy's playing? And her dad said, it's a bass. And she said, well, I want one. And they got her a cello because she's not that big. <laughs> All right. Uh, in her spare time, uh, she enjoys going to the beach with her family, and you can always find her reading. She reads and reads and reads. She enjoys Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and any type of fantasy. Uh, we are going to miss her. She's a very smiling face. She's a student who always says hi to you, is always willing to help out. Um, we're proud of everything she's accomplished at Bradley. We look forward to hearing all about what you're going to do next. All right, so thank you, Greer, who is named after... Greer Garson, 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 who's an actress. Her name's Scottish, and then Declan and Callum are Irish, so I did a little research there. <laughs> All right. So, Greer, thank you very much. We're very proud of you, and go Bears. All right. I'm not going to say anything tonight. On behalf of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, I want to congratulate you, your family, who's very proud of you, your brothers, and your teachers. Thank you to Ms. Parker and your wonderful principal. We're very proud of you. Keep up the good work. And the good news is next year at junior high, there is band. So if you are interested in music, keep it up. And we're, we'll be very happy to see you in the band next year. Congratulations, sweetheart.
Congratulations again. And next we have Lynn Scott, Jocelyn Carrera. Come on up with all of your supporters. Good evening, I'm Julie Wiley, Principal at Lynn Scott Charter School. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Jocelyn Carrera, our Outstanding Student of the Year. She is an eighth grader and she's gonna be leaving us in just a few weeks and heading to Watsonville High School. She has set a very high bar for her two brothers who are also students at Lynn Scott and um, her mom, Yvonne and Mario, are also here, very proud of her. I'm gonna let her math and science teacher, Brett Hagerman, tell you a little bit more about all of her wonderful qualities. So the uh, excerpt I have here is uh, written from a teaching colleague of mine and a few other extra words that I've included. Jocelyn Carrera, you have been selected as Lynn Scott Charter Student of the Year for 2017-18. In a class of many outstanding and high achieving students, you stand apart as not only an exemplary student, but an all-around fine person. Every student at Lynn Scott knows that you will lend a helping hand if they are in need. You are kind-hearted, empathetic, and have a great moral compass. When it comes to your academics, you are no, no sense, no nonsense kind of woman. You attack your academics with tenacity. You are inquisitive and, de and a determined learner and have consistently earned top grades in all subjects. You're an avid reader, enthusiastic writer, and a critical thinker, and are steadily increasing your insight and awareness of the world. All of us at Lynn Scott look forward to hearing of the great things that you will accomplish in your life. Congratulations. I don't need a microphone for this. Us, Pottle Valley Unified School District. Congratulations. And next from Pajaro Valley High School, we have Evelyn Torres Topete. Is Evelyn and her family here? Oh no, okay. Uh Well, if they, if they come, give us a signal, and we will um, move them right to where we are on, on the agenda. President DeRose, they're in route. Okay, so just let me uh, know when they Hopefully, they'll here. be here. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so we will be moving back to that item. Um, so let's go to 3.5, and this is reports from the board and standing committee. So I'll start on this end. Anything, Jeff? No. Trustee Acosta? No. Karen? I have a lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go back to where I started. So I went to the Children's Day at Alianza mm. and actually rode my bike there. And I live in the Children's Day. I actually climbed the climbing. I, I actually I, I rode my bike there to the Children's Day Alianza and I actually climbed the climbing wall that they had there too. I, I did, so that was good too. Um, 
and I went to the open house for Hall School, and um, it was really wonderful because they had their band, they had the band that was playing there, it was so wonderful, and they had Mexican folklore dancers that were from in the kindergarten, and then they had a whole choir that sang for us, a whole choir, it was really great. Um, I went to the SELPA meeting, the last meeting where they had programs that people put out for, you can go and learn all the things you can do for the summertime for your, for your special ed students. That was good. Um, I went to this Seal of Biliteracy celebration last night. It was pretty exciting. It was at the Mellow Center that's usually outside at our, at our district office. So this time it was at the um, Mellow Center. And they actually celebrated all the um, elementary school students um, that are fully bilingual from kindergarten all the way to fifth grade. It was pretty cool. So each school came up and had all their language ambassadors, as they called them, up, up to the stage to celebrate them too. And it was pretty awesome because I was able to, with Michelle, to put the the necklace medal over their, over each student's head, over their head, the medals that they wear for their graduation. That was pretty awesome. And the last one, I went to the Teacher Appreciation Day today, um, was at four o'clock at Jalisco's, and there were three Teachers of the Year that were celebrated. Two of them were special education teachers, and the other one was, a uh, really fabulous activist kind of a teacher because she stopped them from using pesticides at Ohlone. She got the whole statewide thing. It was part of what she did to make sure that they had borders around where they were going to spray the pesticides. She really worked on that. And she was teacher of the, of the year from Ohlone. So that was, that's what I did. And really quickly, I'm going to go to the Down to the Earth Women event tomorrow for the, for the, um, for the uh, Farm Bureau, and then on Friday I have to go to, a, it's a weird time that they have it, a migrant head start meeting the next day. So, and in all of these events, I, Michelle was there too. Uh, Michelle was there at the Children's Day, she was at the Seal of Biliteracy, and she was at Teacher Appreciation Day, and so was Maria. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Thank you for going to all of those, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, Karen, that's great. Um, Yesterday was a very special day at Aptos High. We dedicated the baseball fields um, to Robert and Paul Bailey, who have done a tremendous amount for the Aptos um, community through the Aptos Sports Foundation. And thank you, Mark Brewer, for being there. We thank Peggy Pugh, our Aptos High principal, and Mark Dorfman for um, organizing a beautiful dedication. The grounds look beautiful, and um, I want to congratulate and with deep, deep gratitude to Robert and Paul Bailey for the hours um, of dedication they've put into um, improving our school community. We really benefit from that, so uh, thank you. Um, I was able to attend um, the countywide youth art show at the Art League. Um, my daughter had a piece of art in it, and um, I was just blown away by the unbelievable talent of young people in our county. I mean, like, it was just really beautiful. I was disappointed, however, to see that our Pajaro Valley High School was not included in some of the, in any of the submissions, and I'm hoping to see that they have submissions next year as the art show is juried and there are money awards. So I think um, that's something that we need to work on for next year. Um, yesterday I attended the Valencia Home and School Club, and it was wonderful to be back. I used to serve on the Home and School Club as their fund development officer. Um, so that was a lot of fun and a lot of questions, and so I was very, very happy to attend. And I will also be joining you, as usual, at the Down to Earth um, Women's Luncheon to support um, agriculture and the Farm Bureau in their efforts to raise money for scholarships for kids in the Pajaro Valley. So thank you very much. Um, so just to prefix what um, 
um, Karen mentioned, we also attended the um, the Jalisco's reception hosted by CAVE and PVFT. I want to extend my congratulations to those teachers that were selected and recognized as Teachers of the Year. But in addition to that, uh, being the week of the teacher, I do want to um, thank all of our PVGUSD teachers, our migrant teachers, uh, for your contributions to our PVSU community and for your commitment to the success of all our students. Thank you so much and congratulations. And this week we celebrate you, actually every day, because you impact um, student lives every single day in many different ways. So thank you for all that you do. And in addition to that, I am looking forward to the DLAC meeting that I will be t attending next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. So um, real quickly, I also want to recognize Day of the Teacher. Um, every, every day our teachers are there supporting our students and our community, so we're all very proud of them, and I just um, want to reiterate that. Um, since the last board meeting, uh, PVPSA, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, which is our nonprofit partner that provides uh, mental health services for our students and our families, um, held a capital campaign event uh, for community members at, at Ella's on, at the airport. So I wanted to say thank you very much to Ella's for hosting, but of course to the leadership of PVPSA for all of the wonderful work that they do every day, but especially on this capital campaign, which um, our intended outcome is to provide more support for more community. Uh, so that was great. And then um, I, I also attended the AXA Awards, which was an awards presentation for administrators throughout the three county, three county region, or, or is it five counties? Jack Sherman from uh, Special Ed and Marcy Keller from Diamond Technology Institute each were awarded, and it was a fabulous event, and it was really nice to be there to support them as well. Um, and that's it for me. We'll go to Willie. And then I was just in informed that um, we have uh, Evelyn, right, from Pearl Valley High School. So we'll go to her next. Uh, thank you. Um, in in a uh, couple of weeks, we will be attending the uh, eighth grade graduations. And in each year, they are outstanding. But I never did understand the shrieking, the 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 sharpness, the yelling and stuff. Last Friday night, or uh, Saturday night, I was able to attend my uh, daughter's um, master's um, graduation in, down, in, down in Irvine. And I was probably with the, with the family, and we were probably the loudest shriekers in this whole place. And now I get it. You know, get it. You got to be on that side of the aisle to understand uh, that that it was a moment that we all enjoyed because of of our uh, daughter's hard work. She was a uh, preschool student here, Minty White, EA Hall, Watsonville High School, UC Irvine, Cal uh, Cal State LA. And um, and and was awarded her a master's at uh, at uh, Condecovia, hmm. Cordia High School um, um, University, and uh, she is a fourth grade uh, teacher in uh, in uh, Tustin Unified. So very very proud of her. I understand the yelling the because I was probably um, yelling prop with a. Lower voice, thank goodness. Thank all of you very much. Thank you very much, Willie. So, Evelyn Torres Topete, are you here with your family? Come on up and get the recognition. Student of the Year. Good evening. Um, I'm Matt Levy. I'm the principal of Pajaro Valley High School, uh, newly. And I'm so new that I still thought the board meetings were at the district office. So that's where we all went. So I apologize for that. And sorry for the delay. But um, I wanted to say a few things and introduce you to Evelyn Torres Topete. Um, 
we're really proud of her. She's actually our student of the year at PV High School. And um, I've personally known Evelyn for, for seven years now. This is my seventh year knowing her. I knew her as a sixth grader at EA Hall. And she was a bright, young little thing in seventh grade. She's grown up. And um, just, a, just a wonderful student, a ball of energy. And she came, came as a sixth grader with a lot of challenges in her life. And she's overcome all of them, even beginning in sixth grade. She's been at PV High for the last four years, and she's achieved a 3.6 GPA. And last night, she was honored with one of the 60-plus seal of biliteracy students we had at PV High School last night. Um, so that was a fabulous ceremony, yeah. Mm. She, along with her hardworking father, helped ra have raised three? Five. Five, sorry. Wow, I haven't even met them all, boys. Um, and two of which are at PV High currently. And um, they, they work hard to keep on those boys. Um, sh words like persistent and driven are using, used by um, staff to describe Evelyn. And hardworking and resilient, I would add. Um, she's a role model for her siblings and her peers alike, showing strong leadership skills. Uh, she'll be attending San Francisco State in the fall, and she wants to focus on psychology and brain development research at this point. And, um, and on a personal note, she is a huge inspiration to me, um, having known her for the last seven years. Um, she's overcome so much and shown me so much, and I always tell her that someday she's going to run the world <laughs> and we're just going to all be working for Evelyn here, so it's going to be <laughs> fabulous. So um, the Grizzly Nation is really proud of Evelyn's accomplishments, and we're so honored that um, we get to honor her here in front of the board. Um, and now, being so Ricky, I don't know, do we allow Evelyn to say some words? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. There you go. Just anything you want. <laughs> Oh, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Mr. Matt Levy for being such a great support um, in my journey. I've um, encountered many challenges throughout my life, um, which uh, I've learned a lot and I've considered as great experience. Um, and I look forward to the future and what it has to bring. And I am very appreciative uh, for... Um, all my teachers and the people around me that have uh, supported me and helped me and guided me through, um, through hard times. Uh, thank you. Is this your proud papa? Okay, congratulations again to all of our students who are recognized tonight. Um, we're going to move on to item four, and that's approval of tonight's agenda. Do I have a motion? Move approval. And second? Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item five is approval of the minutes for our last meeting of April 25th. Um, do our is there a motion to approve? I move approve. approval. Second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstain. Abstain. Okay. Motion passes 
502. Thank you. And item six is our high school board representatives report. What schools do we have here tonight? All right, okay, Pearl Valley, come on up. Are you all from Pearl Valley? Okay, great. Thanks for being here. Okay, so we're we're students from Power Valley High, and this year I was ASB president. My name is Lizette Gonzalez, and it's my honor to introduce next year's representatives that will be coming to these board meetings. My name is Daniel Rocha. I'm the ASB vice president. My name is Jaylene Solorzano, and I am the ASB president for the following year. My name is Sofia Avalos, and I'm. Um, Class Vice President for the following year. She's a senior, and this is going to be for 2018-2019 year. So recently we've had track seasons coming to an end, and the master meet is on Friday. Caitlin Strader, who's a sophomore, just tied the school record in the high jump, jumping 4 feet 10 inches. Luis Leonor broke the school record for the for pole vault with a record of 12 feet. And then the relay team, which I'm part of, Alexandra Romero, Emma Arroyo, and Kaylin Pat, we recently broke the school record with 54 se uh, seconds. And we're all going to be competing this Friday at the Master Meet. So election convention took place for class, and this is how all of these students were elected for the next following year. And we actually did it like if they were voting, students got to pre-register, and we borrowed the voting spoots from Santa Cruz County. So last week we had a game of kickball between the teachers and it took place during lunch and we call it Battle of the Buildings as the H building teachers play against the E building and this Friday um, students will play versus students and then uh, the winner will win a prize. Then the winner of the students versus the students will go up against the H building because that is the building that won against the two buildings. So now it's Spirit Week, and Spirit Week takes off on May 4, 3, 14 through the 18. The theme is board games, and the days are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The Monday theme is Jumanji, Tuesday's theme is Candyland, Wednesday's theme is Monopoly, Thursday's theme is The Life, Game of Life, I'm sorry. Friday is Class Colors. Um, this is typically how students dress for class colors. The posters on the wall are coordinated to the theme of the rally. And then these are a few of the classes who dress in their class colors. We have the class of 2018 in yellow, the class of 2020 in green, the freshman class in orange, and then finally the junior class in purple. And then also a little more about ASB, since we don't really talk about what the students actually do other than the events, is that we do hold events to help students become involved. The other day we had Loteria on the lawn, and that is like the Mexican bingo. And then we also provided food to the students who came out and joined us, and we also gave them popsicles because it was a warm week. And we also had cornhole, as you can see the students, I don't know how to, mm, I don't know how to use this, but the students on the right hand side are playing cornhole. Cornhole. It's the, it's where you throw the bean bag into the hole. <laughs> and then as senior year does come to an end for each season, we had senior nights. We had soccer senior night, football. We had the basketball senior nights, the volleyball senior nights. We had cheer senior nights. And then today was softball senior night. And then on Friday, we are going to have baseball senior night. And that will conclude the senior nights for the year. And that is all for the presentation. We want to thank you for giving us your attention.
Okay, thanks again for being here. We always enjoy your presentations. Um, we're going to move to item 7.1, and this is visitor non agenda items, public comment. And I believe we have 22 speakers. This is generally a 20 minute item, but we'll go a minute and a half per speaker. And what uh, Maria will do is she'll call out three names at a time. If speakers can line up and be ready to come to the podium, um, that would be great. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Have we got one with no We do. Number? So we have a speaker card that was submitted by Carlos Cruz, but there's no item. So I'm trying to, is it for 7.1? Sí. Uh, no más quería verificar que el, que el número de, de, en la agenda es 7.1, ¿verdad? Ok. Ok. So we have um, James Lodi, followed by María Hernández, followed by uh, Rosa Segura. Hi, I'm James Lottie. I've been a second grade teacher at Hollister Prep School for four going on five years. I came to the school fresh off subbing in a district in Southern California. I subbed for just one semester, but contrary to the advice of my professors and mentor teachers, did not feel that I was improving. The following year, I accepted a position at HPS and in just a few months grew more than I ever had as a sub. One source of this change was the rigorous coaching provided at Navigator Schools. Each week I would sit down with my coach and look at video of my classroom practices. Through the eyes of a more experienced teacher, I was able to identify areas of growth. We set achievable action steps that enabled me to improve quickly and knowledgeably. My improvement as an educator highlights one of the qualities essential to Navigator Schools, growth mindset. We are always striving to identify areas of growth and find means of improvement. Another essential quality of Navigator Schools is adaptability. The after-school intervention program offered to our first and second grade students is a great example of both adaptability and growth mindset. The focus in first and second grade is on learning how to read, increasing fluency, and building reading comprehension skills. To this end, after the normal school day is done, every day, except Wednesday, there will be a selection of students who stay in my classroom to practice reading. This intervention block was piloted my first year at HPS and had not previously been a part of the educational model. But after seeing the wonderful results, it has continued every year since. At the beginning of this current school year, Sorry. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I will be translating for her. So when she is done, then I will complete the translation. Hola. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es María. Um, yo estoy aquí en representación de muchos padres que quisieran estar aquí y no pueden, para exigirles un cambio. Y es que en estos momentos todos estamos conscientes de que la educación académica que nuestros hijos están recibiendo no es la mejor, ni la adecuada, ni la correcta. Los tiempos están cambiando y las estadísticas demuestran que nuestras escuelas están quedando atrás debido a la manera antigua y caduca que se les está impartiendo las materias. Y por esa razón, los estudiantes se quedan atrás sin la oportunidad de poder competir a un nivel superior. Y si ustedes le dicen a Watsonville Prep no, solo nos estarán dando un impulso a nosotros los padres para luchar por la educación de nuestros hijos. Muchísimas gracias. Good evening, Ms. Mrs. Rodriguez and the board members. My name is Mari Hernandez. I am here representing many parents who would like to be here to demand a change. And at this time, we all are aware that the academic education that our children are receiving is not the best, nor the right, nor the correct. 
Times are changing and statistics show that our schools are falling behind due to old and outdated ways in which subjects are being taught. And for that reason, students are left behind without the opportunity to compete at a higher level. And if you say no to Watsonville Prep, you are giving me a bigger push to fight for my children and their education. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Rodriguez and board members. My name is Rosa Segura, and I have a daughter in second grade at Hollister Prep School. We initially registered her in a private school, and they evaluated her and told us that she will need a speech and occupational therapy service that didn't um, have. So essentially, the private school rejected my daughter. We had also registered her at Hollister Prep School, but she didn't initially get into the lottery for kinder. So she started at the Hollister School District. My daughter is a special needs student in Hollister School District trying to send her to the special day class. We didn't agree with that because our psychologist at Kaiser told us developmentally that will not help her. A couple months later, Hollister Prep School called to inform us that they had a spot available. So we decided to transfer her and that was the best decision that we had ever made. Navigator School have been great with her. They provide the therapy and evaluations she needs, and they're always searching for different ways to help her succeed. I love the way that the school is a full inclusion school. They don't separate the students with the special needs from the rest of the kids. I feel that it's very important for the kids to learn how to be respectful and how to help kids with the special needs. The teachers and the paraprofessionals never give up and they constantly motivate her to continue to do her best. I really believe the Navigator School has a lot of good things to offer to any community. Thank you so much, Navigator Schools. Thank you, Sharon. I'm always, as my daughter always say, you don't give up, you can do it. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have Nora Crivello, followed by Gilberto Pozos, followed by Carlos Cruz, followed by Neftali Castañeda. Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Nora Crivello. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I will try my best to condense it down. Um, I'd like to speak on behalf of Watsonville Prep Charter Application, and I speak to you both as a parent of the school and as a current member of the Board of Directors of Navigator School. So I have a really holistic approach of what's, or a holistic view of what's going on at the schools. There were some comments made at the board meeting last week that were um, based on hyperbole and they were not factual, and I was hoping to address a couple of those and kind of set the record straight. One of them was that as a charter school, we have the ability to deny special needs kids and therefore um, have the funds go somewhere else. My daughter is uh, legally blind and the school not only provides her everything she needs, she's thriving there. And as Rosa just said, Sharon and her team are excellent about making sure that our special needs kids thrive at the school and our SPED population is the same as the county and the state levels. Um, two other things I wanted to address both had to do with the board. One of them was that we don't have community representation. As I said, I myself am a parent and on the board. There's another parent representative from Gilroy Prep. Uh, we have two other additional community members. One's a leader in the Gilroy area, and one is actually a leader in the Watsonville area. She's uh, Fia is the current president of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, in addition to that, we have four charter school subject matter experts. So we have a, a great board that work well together. Um, another kind of board-centric thing I wanted to address was the issue of transparency. Our board, just like yours, follows the Brown Act. We follow all the rules for quorum. Our meetings are published, they are agendized, they are publicized, they are uh, on Zoom, they are full inclusion, they are multilingual, um, and they're broadcast. And the next one is next Tuesday, so I'd like to invite all of you to attend that board meeting, and I'd like to personally invite you to come tour any one of the schools. I'll personally take a day off work, come down, you can meet my daughter and all of her friends, and um, if I were in your shoes, I'd want to make this vote based on the most factual observations that I could possibly have. I think that that would include a visit to the school. So please come on out and visit. Uh, Willie, you asked how we're getting the results. We'd love to show you. So thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Again, I will be uh, translating when he is completed with his speech. Muy buenas noches, señora Rodríguez y miembros del Consejo Estudiantil. Mi nombre es Gilberto Pozos. Um, con pocas palabras, um, he decidido venir aquí a pararme aquí delante de ustedes, uh, únicamente para recordarles que una buena educación comienza con un currículo concreto, es decir, seguir las normas de enseñanza con la calidad impecable que merece y el enfoque en la necesidad del estudiante. Por lo cual, estoy apoyando a Watsonville Prep School para que se abra este nuevo centro estudiantil que ofrece ese currículo o normas de enseñanza, los cuales no se han visto en las escuelas existentes del distrito. Yo como padre de familia, no podría conformarme con la educación que recibiría mi hija en estas escuelas y tampoco quisiera estar en, los, en el lugar de muchos padres que están pasando por momentos difíciles, por las formas y tipo de educación que sus hijos están recibiendo. Yo, al igual que muchos otros padres de familia, exigimos el derecho que nos corresponde para elegir a qué escuela podemos llevar e involucrarnos con nuestros hijos. No queremos que ustedes decidan el futuro de nuestros hijos negándoles oportunidades nuevas. Somos nosotros como padres que queremos lo mejor y por ende luchamos para que hayan más opciones, más oportunidades para un mejor futuro para nuestros hijos. Good evening, uh, Mrs. Rodriguez, board members. My name is Gilberto Pozos. With a few words, I have decided to come and stand here in front of you only to remind you that a good student education begins with a specific curriculum that is follow the teacher standards with the impeccable quality it deserves and the focus on the student's need, for which I am supporting Watsonville Prep School to open. This new charter that offers that curriculum or teaching standards that have not been seen in the existing schools of the district. As a parent, I would not settle for the education that my daughter would receive in these schools, and I would not like to be in the place of many parents who are going through difficult times because of the forms and types of education their children are currently receiving. And I, like many parents, we demand our rights to choose which school we can take and get involved with our children. We do not want you to decide the future of our children, putting them in places that are nothing else for them. We are the parents that want the best, and that is why we fight so that there are more options, more opportunities. Thank you. Trustee, I mean, uh, President DeRose. We have our own district translator that we are paying to translate what the members of the public are saying, and I don't think it's appropriate for them to have this translator because she's not using the proper tone that the, the speaker is um, using. And so I'm, one, I'm, I'm asking that our district translator translates what the members of the public are saying unless she can actually translate a tone that, that is more in line with what the actual person is speaking. I'm not sure that we have the ability to deny um, translation from the public. I don't, is there any precedence for that that you know of? This translator's tone is not matching what these parents are saying. I do understand that. Right. And so it's not congruent, and so I would just ask either we use our own translator or that she translates appropriately. I apologize. I will follow the. I'll get the translation to how they're reading. Uh, match their tone. I know you yes. probably, I think what Trustee DeSerpa is saying is it's clear that you have a, a strong opinion as well, but if you could reflect the speaker's opinion instead of your own, My apologies. we'll let you go ahead and move forward with the translation. Okay. okay. Buenas noches a todos. Este, gracias por permitirme ser escuchado. Mi nombre es Carlos Cruz. Este, tengo tres hijas, ah, desde, que, desde que me convertí en padre, yo he querido una mejor educación para mis, para mis hijas, 
Y siempre tuve en mente este, que atendieran una charter school. Entonces decidí este, inscribir a mi hija en Linscott Charter School. Y, este, y eh, se quedó en el lugar número 35 de la lista de espera. Y la lista de espera en total son 61 niños esperando por un lugar. Entonces yo este, les demando de que nos permitan formar esta escuela, porque sí la necesitamos, ¿verdad? Porque hay muchos niños esperando por un tipo de esta, de esta escuela. Gracias. Hello, everyone. My name is Carlos Cruz. Thank you for letting me be heard. I just want to demand you to allow us to open Navigator Schools in our community. I have three daughters, one is five years old, the second is three, and six month baby girl. Since I became a parent, I wanted my children to attend a charter school. I enrolled my five-year-old daughter to Lynn Scott Charter School, but she has got on the waiting list there. It's number 61 on the list, and my daughter got 35th place. So I know we need a navigator school here in Watsonville. Thank you. Good evening, board members and superintendent. My name is Natalia Casaneda. Today I want to share with you at a glance my personal and academic growth as a seventh grade student at GPS. I started GPS in second grade. I was an at risk student. You know the type of student that below grade average in both ELA and mathematics, the type of student that people tend to give up on? Yes, well, that was me in the Guerrero Unified School District. I was just another number that was overlooked at. Everything changed when I came to GPS. My teachers have worked extra hard by my side since day one, always striving for my academic success. Here at GPS, I have a strong support system from my teachers, administration, and other school staff members that allow me to prosper academically, personally, emotionally, and always make me feel like I am part of a community, but most importantly, a family. I have seen major majority of my growth now that I have embarked on my middle school journey. I have been given many opportunities inside and outside the classroom that have helped me improve my academics, communication with peers and adults, my abilities and contributions when working in small groups, but most importantly, and developing leadership skills that I never would have imagined I could have, nor did I ever think I had. I would like to share with you my greatest accomplishment so far this year. This student that was below grade average and that was given no hope for academic achievement tested at a 10th grade in mathematics. I will keep beating the odds because students like me, myself, like myself at GPS have learned to never give up and always work hard because we are capable of closing the achievement gap. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, so we have Vanessa Castañeda, followed by Kendra Stone, followed by Lisa Griffith, followed by Heather Parsons. Had to call me after my sister went up. Oh man, um, I just got so emotional. <sighs> Sorry. Good evening, board members and superintendent. Oh. My name is Vanessa Castaneda, and I'm a sixth grade math teacher at Navigator Schools. As educators, we have a high regard for education and its power to transform individuals, families, communities, and society for the better. Reflecting on my educational experience, Navigator Schools is the foundation I wish I had growing up. Going through school is difficult. <sighs> not because I wasn't smart enough, but because people did not believe in me. Being of Hispanic descent allowed many of my educators to feel like I was not worth the effort, since my kind never prospers. I was, led to find, I was left to fight the odds alone. I worked extra hard to stand out academically because I knew that doing my best in school and achieving academic success was the only way of giving back to my parents. It was the only way of reassuring them that the purpose of immigrating to the U.S. was not in vain and that it would prosper and help them achieve the American dream. I'm a first-generation college student, college graduate at both of, from both of my families. All of my co cousins could have pursued a college education, but they fell at an academic disadvantage, leaving them discouraged within the educational system. Students are faced with many obstacles every day. 
it being academically, financially, socially, emotionally, etc. However, I am honored to say that on Navigator School campuses, every child is equipped to prosper, regardless of their circumstances, and we do this by ensuring that educators are continuously improving to deliver the best quality education and support students actually deserve. I'm grateful of the coaching I receive at Navigator Schools, and I'm thankful that I'm cultivated in a working environment where everyone's encouraged and supported to improve, because at the end of the day, we want to cater to the students. I aspire to be a founding teacher for WPS because I want to make sure that every student is able to close the achievement gap, just like I was, but actually feel supported. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, before you go, just a quick comment. So after we start discussing a certain agenda item, we are no longer taking speaker cards, okay? So it's really, uh, you have to submit one before the item begins. Okay, so at this point, we're not taking any more speaker cards. Hi, I'm not sure if it's quite my turn. My name is Lisa Griffith. I live in the Rio Del Mar area. I've noticed many signs on my street urging people to support the teachers in our area. I've seen teachers with signs on my commute to work. I looked up the teacher, the teacher salary schedule on the district website and was appalled at what I saw. Teachers have the most important job in our community. They're teaching and caring for our future. People are the most important part of any organization. And making sure employees are valued should be priority number one. I do not have a child in a school in this district. I am simply a resident that lives within the borders of this school district, and I pay taxes into this community. As a resident of this area, I'm here tonight because I see something that is not right in my neighborhood and I want to see change in the budgeting priority of this school district to pay teachers a fair salary. I ask this school district to pay the teachers who serve the children in my community a wage that is more aligned with our cost of living in this area and for the incredibly hard work that they do. I ask the teachers if there are any here tonight, what can I do to support you? What else can I talk to my neighbors and friends about to support you? Most importantly, I would like to say I'm sorry to these teachers and thank you. I passed those signs and the teachers and only waved to them and honked my horn without researching what was going on in my neighborhood. What they've been asking for these past few months, now I know. And I also thank you very much for educating our children. Um, so there were two other names that I called. Are they not here? Hi, I'm Heather Parsons. The passion you have heard and will you continue to hear tonight is fueled by our knowledge that the Navigator model works. It works because there's a level of personalization in this learning at Navigator that I have never encountered in my entire career. And this personalization leads to incredible student outcomes. For us, personalization means that every student and every staff member gets exactly what they need when they need it. How do we personalize learning? Small group instruction. We don't just do centers. We have dynamic and differentiated instruction that is tailored to the student's needs. Coaching. We coach every teacher and every leader every single week and personalize action steps for them. Intervention. Intervention groups are daily and they're changed daily based on yesterday's data. That's incredible. Technology. We don't just buy tech. We assign personalized programs and goals based on student gaps. Inclusion. Our staff personalizes push-in learning for students with special needs. We did not invent this level of personalization. We went out across the country and we found high-performing schools that are doing this. And we use their ingredients to form our recipe for success. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have Martha Denny, followed by 
Kendra Stone, followed by Becky Steinbrenner, and Melissa La Torre Andas. Good evening. My name is Marta Denny. I am a president and CEO of two local businesses. I'm proud to be a member of this community, and I am committed to continue my work mentoring others to succeed as well. As a parent and a business owner, I'm troubled with the overall low academic performance of many of the students at the PBUSD and very alarmed about the even lower academic performance of the students who are Hispanic. According to the state, 84% of PBUSD Hispanic third graders were not proficient in English language arts, meaning they're reading far below grade level. 85% of your fourth graders are not proficient. 81% of fifth graders are not proficient. 78% of sixth graders are not proficient. And by eighth grade, the percentage decreases to 76% of Hispanic students not proficient. What that means is, out of the 7,667 third to eighth graders PVUSD Hispanic students tested, 6,024 of them are not proficient in English language art last year. In the area of math, out of the 7,667 students from third to eighth grade, 6,493 of these students were not proficient. These scores are extremely disturbing. I have a daughter who is Hispanic and is set to go to kindergarten in the fall, and I do not want her to be a statistic. I want a better choice, and this is your status. I understand PBUSD challenges, then yet again, I believe all Watson Bill youth are capable, able, and should have the opportunity to a good education because I know this will lead to a better life. I want to have a choice when it comes to my daughter's education, and I believe we need to have more schools that will prepare our children for a great future. Don't deprive our children for the opportunity you cannot provide. For my daughter and for many other students, I'm asking you to support Watsonville Prep School. Thank you. So um, I do want to ask for our parents and community members who are here to speak. When I call out your names in three, please make sure that you line up, OK, so that we can move along the process. Good evening. My name is Melissa Alatorre Alnas, and I am the director of HR for Navigator Schools. I have 20 plus years experience as an educator and have served not only here at Navigator, but as a bilingual teacher and site principal in a public school district. When I came to Navigator in 2016, my eyes were opened to the support and choice that Navigator Public Schools offers both adults and children in our community. Tonight, I'm going to share with you a bit of how we support our staff through through coaching, which provides the tools that they need to support students. Our Navigator teammates, or employees, live in the communities of our two existing schools and have chosen to join our mission-driven organization that provides personalized support through coaching. All staff participate in weekly coaching, in a weekly coaching cycle that results in accelerated professional growth, which in turn results in accelerated student growth. When a staff member struggles, there are safety nets in place, including high impact coaching, mentoring, and if necessary, performance improvement plans. We do not give up on our staff. At our core, we believe in continuous growth and provide every opportunity to thrive. And when staff thrive, students thrive. These continuous efforts have led to high retention and staff satisfaction rates. I am proud to share that our staff retention rate is 93.5%. And in a recent survey, Navigator staff reported that 90% 90 90 of Navigator staff, excuse me, would recommend Navigator employment to a friend. I ask that you give families and students the over 200 families that have asked for and deserve the choice of a navigator school. 
please approve the position, petition for Watsonville Prep to open in fall 2019. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really tired. So am I correct that Becky Steinbrunner may is the next one? Thank you very much. And thank you for accepting my card. I had to work late, so I arrived late. Thank you very much. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm here to speak on a different topic, but I'm very interested in what I hear here tonight. What I want to talk with you about tonight is the cliff swallow nesting going on at Pajaro Valley High School. Those swallows have been there since the school was built. It's a flock of over 1,000 that returns to this year, to this area, every year from South America to build their nests and raise their young and eat a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> um, unfortunately, what has happened is the district has paid a lot of money to have someone put in Lexan strips to preclude the birds from being able to nest under the eaves of this school. It's a lot of money. The, the birds have returned and they're still trying to nest. And it's very tragic to watch them try to build their nests. The school district has given uh, permission for the operations and facilities to knock the nests down with water in an area that is um, overdrafted. We're using water to knock down bird nests. I have spoken with several biologists, uh, Dr. Brown from Tulsa University in Oklahoma, who is a sw cliff swallow specialist. I have communicated with Ms. Veronica Bowers at the Native uh, Songbird Rescue Service in Sonoma. She assures me that the birds will not just go away. What will happen is that they won't be able to raise their young and their population will decline. They are genetically imprinted on the school, just like salmon are genetically imprinted on sites where they return to lay their eggs. They recognize the, the structures, the shadows, the colors, and that is where they have to go. They're still trying to go to the school to nest. They're not going to go away to some other place, as I've been told by a school district official. They're going to die. Their population will die. Now, I don't think this is this, the, what we really want to be giving uh, our students and our staff and our community the, the message. Well, there is a group of biologists that's willing to, for free, uh, put up structures, alternate nesting structures, but in order for the birds to use them, they have to be nearby. All we need is the district's permission. We'll do the, the work, we'll supply the materials, and the birds will use them if they're in the proper place. The Mosquito Vector Agency was begun in 1994 because of mosquito problems. <coughs> These birds are helping to control the mosquitoes. Please, all we need is your permission to build alternate structures. They have been done. We can show you the, um, the structures. All we need is your permission, and these birds will very happily use them, and we will send a better message, an opportunity to learn for our students, staff, and community. I have to ask you Thank to you. wrap it up. Thank you. Okay, so we have Amy and Bella Brown, followed by Guadalupe Gallardo, followed by... Um, Indra Carr, oh, I'm sorry, Kirsten Carr, uh, followed by Alexandra Heredia. Hi, my name is Bella Brown. The reason why I love GPS is because the teachers are incredible and they help me. If I get stuck on work that I don't really know how to do, and the second reason why I love GPS is because a safe school and they do a good job of making me making sure I'm okay and safe. My, f my friends at GPS are the nicest people that I ever met in my life. I was the dance team last year and it was so much fun. First we had dance practice and got to do dance at the basketball games and I was really excited. I went to science camp last year and we got to eat awesome food and have cookies. We had story time and 
It was really fun. Thank you for your time. Bella is a seventh grader at GPS, and um, I'm her mother, Amy Brown. Um, I wanted to just say what a life-changing experience it's been for Bella to be at GPS. Um, she started our local elementary school uh, for kindergarten. I was told that <coughs> I, I needed to come to terms with her limitations and that she should be in a special day class. This wasn't how I saw Bella, nor where I thought she should be placed. So we transferred to uh, the first year at GPS as a first grader. And the first thing that that they said was they saw her potential and what she could accomplish. And she's accomplished more than I could possibly have imagined, even as her parent. And um, I just hope for <coughs> some of the other kids in Watsonville, they have the opportunity to blossom like she has. Thank you. Thank you. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Guadalupe Gallardo. Hoy estoy aquí otra vez pidiendo su apoyo para Watsonville Prep. Estoy aquí luchando y seguiré luchando por el futuro de mi pequeñito de tres años y por todos los niños de mi comunidad. Hoy en día tengo un niño de 15 años que está en high school y que lamentablemente no está leyendo como un niño de high school debería estar leyendo. Toda su vida escolar aquí en, en Watsonville, año tras año lo he mirado batallar y sufrir por no poder leer bien ni escribir bien. No quiero la misma historia para mi niño que ahorita tiene tres años. Siento que como mamá es mi deber luchar por darle una mejor educación y estoy segura que con Watsonville Prep lo voy a lograr. Porque pri, en primer lugar ellos tienen la mejor tecnología, Navigator Schools, tienen grupos más pequeños, esto significa muchísima más atención para los niños. Y lo último, por lo que a mí me fascinó, me encantó, fue mirar a los niños de kinder leyendo. Que eso con mi niño de 15, que ahorita tiene 15 años, nunca pasó. Y yo quiero que mi niño de 3 años le esté leyendo cuando esté en kinder. Um, quiero una página nueva para su vida, no quiero que la misma historia se repita con, con él la misma historia que le pasó a mi niño que ahorita está en high school. Um, yo confío en que ustedes me van a ayudar. Muchísimas gracias por escucharme. Good evening. My name is Guadalupe Gallardo, and I'm here once again. Today, I am here again asking for your support for Watsonville Prep School. I am here fighting, and I'll keep fighting for the future of my three-year-old boy and for all the children in my community. I have a 15-year-old boy in high school, and unfortunately, he's not reading at a high school. Kid should be reading. All of his school life here in Watsonville, year after year, I watched him struggle and suffer because he cannot read well or write well. I do not want the same story to repeat itself with my little one, and I feel that as a mom, it is my duty to fight to give him a better education, and I'm sure that with Watsonville Prep School, it will be achieved. They have the best technology, navigator schools have smaller groups, and this means a lot more attention for the children. Finally, what I loved was to look at how kindergartners were already reading, something that with my first child never had, and I want to look out for my three-year-old. I want a new chapter for his life, and I trust that you will help me. Hi, I'm Kirsten Carr with the bad handwriting. Sorry about that. I am a huge college sports fan, so often rely on the wisdom of coaches who have led championship teams. And John Wooden of UCLA basketball fame has one of my favorite quotes. Do not be afraid of failure, but learn from it. For us at Navigator, that translates to continuous improvement. Continuous improvement isn't just a catchphrase we use. It isn't just a slogan on the wall. We live it every day. And that is something that has brought us to you here today, asking for your support for Watsonville Prep School. We opened in Gilroy in 2011, and upon request by the former superintendent, opened HPS in 2013. Then, in our haste to afford equal opportunity to a larger number of students through the Navigator School's model, we made mistakes in moving too quickly. But the mistakes are not what defines us. What defines us is what we did next. We stopped, we learned, and we continuously improved on our own performance. We did that by deliberately slowing growth and focusing on our organizational health. We strengthened our two current schools 
and solidified a process before we would even think about a new charter submission. And we learned from our failed attempts. That learning process ensured we were ready when Watsonville parents and community members asked for our assistance. And that process has me here tonight, standing before you, asking for your support to help us ensure every child in Watsonville has a chance. Please join us and let us become the educational equivalent of John B Wooden's basketball legacy here with Watsonville Prep School and PVUSD. Thank you. Hello. Tonight I come to you not as an employee who happens to be a parent. What is your name? Alexandra Haradio. Thank you. But I come to you as a parent who is so inspired by the mission to further my own education and come back to a navigator school because I believe in the mission. I believe in the mission because my child was a of, was in the first class of kinder at GPS when it opened. She was far behind grade level and James and Sharon held after school intervention for her and for children in the similar situation, not only for the kids, but for the parents too, to learn how to teach their children at home. My daughter managed to edge out just enough in mathematics to move on to first grade. By second grade, she reached gra grade level. Not only did she close the achievement gap, but now she is in sixth grade. She is a student that leads small group discussions. She is one of the top in her class. Not only did she close the achievement gap, but now has a goal. She started at Navigator. She always heard, at Navigator, she always heard college. Now she tries to get the highest grades she possibly can and get the classes that she, to get the classes that she wants in high school in order to go to a university and become an engineer. She has a goal. She's 11 years old. She's sixth grader. My second grader is now reading at a fourth grade level and scored a 4.7, nearly fifth grade in mathematics. And in ELA, she was a fourth grade, and she's only a second grade. For these reasons, I am proud I made the choice. And that is why tonight I ask that if these parents want a choice, let them have a choice. Thank you. All right, we have Scott Parsons. Debbie Benitez, Luis Carrillo, and Graviela Roldan. Good evening, I'm Scott Parsons. Um, in the late 1970s, the NFL teams had a very basic offense. They did this because it's what they learned, it's what they were coached to do, it's what they knew for the previous 20, 30, 40 years of their NFL or football careers. In 1979, the San Francisco 49ers hired Bill Walsh to be their head coach. He brought an innovative and complex West Coast offense to the 49ers, and in three of the last next eight years, they won the Super Bowl. But this is not his greatest feat. Bill Walsh taught his other coaches and players how to run the West Coast offense. They, in turn, took that information to other teams and were successful and won Super Bowls. His legacy and his greatest feat was passing that on and not making the 49ers great, but making the whole NFL great. I served this community from 2007 to 2014 as an officer for the Wattsville Police Department. Four of those years on the gang task force, and I was here for that last meeting in April. And what I heard frustrated me. What I heard, in my opinion, is instead of being focused on how all educators can work together to ensure top quality education for their students, there seemed to be a self-preservation based on fear. In most other walks of life, whether it's business, the NFL, teaching, if somebody comes up with a better way of doing it, you either learn from that or you sink. Not done. Judging by the publicized test scores, the local students, they're sinking. That won't change if we continue to try the same thing again and again. You have a proven entity here in Navigator Schools that want to come to your community and help the students, but you don't want them. As an officer, if Watsonville Police Department had another outside entity that knew how to keep gang crime down in this community, and they didn't allow them into their community, how would you feel about that? Would you be happy about that? I don't think so. I ask you to vote for Navigator Schools, have them come to your community, and help them educate your children. 
Just like Bill Walsh, this district and Navigator Schools can also leave a legacy, a legacy of impacting every child you come across. Thank you. Good evening. I stand before you tonight as both a proud Navigator employee and as a former district employee of 18 years who was unsure of this new organization, Navigator, who was coming to my town to show us where we, what we were doing wrong. My team and I at the time felt as many of you, what many of you are feeling tonight, as if our hard work and dedication to our students was being questioned. We were working our fingers to the bone, late hours, weekends, and holidays, yet our students were not achieving the levels we knew they were capable of. My defensiveness kept me from viewing Navigator's arrival as an opportunity instead of a threat. So what did we do? We reached out to Navigator because we knew if they could do it, so could we. We toured GPS and what we found shocked us. We found that all the reasons we had made up in our heads about Navigator's success were simply not true. From the moment I walked into their classrooms, I realized how wrong I was. Yes, there were lots of similarities between what I was doing in my classroom and what I was seeing in their classroom, but there were differences as well. And these differences were where I gravitated. I had a million questions, but I also had the thought, there's no way I can do this in my classroom. But that is where I was even more wrong. They handed me everything. Take this, use this, ask us, and boy did I. My team and I brought this information back to our school and implemented the model as much as we could in a traditional public classroom and had amazing success. It is this commitment to collaboration that attracted me to become a navigator. We stand shoulder to shoulder with your teachers. We are all here for our children and we ask that you vote for Navigator and vote for Watsonville Prep to give your students a choice and your teachers another teammate to work with. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Rodriguez and Board of Education members. My name is Luis Carrillo. I'm a retired uh, school principal. I was at the school was Rod Kelly School. I was a sc uh, school principal for 21 years. And I'd like to give you a perspective from a public school um, in terms of that benefited from the collaboration with um, Navigator Schools. Uh, our school, Rod Kelly School, has seen phenomenal growth since 2010. And the reason is because of the innovative practices that have been implemented through the collaboration with James Dent and Navigator Schools. And some of the best practices that were implemented are empowered teacher leadership and grade level collaboration, student engagement through whole brain teaching, integration of technology, alignment and pacing of grade level common core state standards, creation and use of curriculum maps, free, frequent common formative assessments, data analysis of student results, a high level of rigor in the classroom, high expectations for all students, including the adults, where everyone was accountable, a, cult a school culture focused on student learning. So Rod Kelly has been extremely fortunate to have this collaboration with Navigator Schools. And the difference, there's, the difference with this charter school is that they want to share these best practices with all of your school leaders. They're willing to do that. It's a matter of changing our mindset about charter schools. They are not all the same. You have an opportunity to be a partner and share these best practices. You have an opportunity to improve your academic achievement outcomes for all your students. Your students deserve this opportunity. <clears throat> I just want to share this next thing with you. It's just that Rod Kelly received out, um, outstanding recognition, and we received many prestigious awards. We received the California State Department of Education Golden Ribbon School, the Title I Academic Achievement Award, and also recognized by Innovate Public Schools as a top barrier school for underserved students and other awards. And this is my second year being retired and, this, and the school was just recognized as being a California Distinguished School Award. My point is that the, the school continues to excel because of all these practices that have been implemented. So Thank I you. urge you to support Navigator School. Thank, Thank you. you. 
So I need to please remind everybody to please stay to your time. I don't want to be rude and cut you off, but if you can all be respectful of the next person's time, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gabriella Roldan, and I'm a sixth grade teacher with Navigator Schools in Hollister, expressing support for Navigator Schools in Watsonville. I'm a first generation Mexican American from a single parent household. I was an English language learner, and I'm my family's first and only college graduate. <clears throat> the last statement is why I'm here tonight. I have two very bright siblings, siblings who are all of those things I mentioned, but without a college degree. Siblings whose educational experiences in elementary, middle, and high school left them feeling inadequate to attend college. There were gaps in their learning that were never met. They viewed themselves and were viewed by quantitative data as poor performing students. Years passed and unfortunately, my siblings became part of the very statistic we are trying to change. Most of the students I work with share my familial background so I can relate to the hardships and difficulties they have to face because I too have lived many of their experiences. And yet, educational statistics, their educational statistics, don't seem to align with those of my families. What do I mean by this last statement? I mean that when my current sixth graders were fifth graders last year, 43 of those 60 students were, were classified as English language learners. That's about 72%. And of those same 60 students, 90% of them scored proficient or advanced on the ELA portion of the SBAC. Is that not incredible? <laughs> Uh, they're so cool. To an end, quantitative data matters in education, especially in college admission. And these students are being shown that it will not be their numbers or statistics that will hold them back from college admission. What's the difference between my siblings' experience and those of my students? Navigator schools, their young lives and their hard work have been given a platform at HPS, at GPS. Please support Navigator's petition and allow this to be the experience of the children of Watsonville. Thank you. Okay, so we have um, Sharon Whaler, followed by Andrea Hernandez, Mariah Butron, Butron and James Dent. Good evening. I'm Sharon Waller, uh, one of the founders of Navigator Schools, Director of Student Services. Um, after analyzing years of data from statewide testing and from our own ex experiences in the local schools we worked in for dozens of years, we saw an urgent need for better school outcomes for children in this area and beyond. With inspiration from our families, other school founders, and great civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King, we decided to, as Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. GPS was founded in 2011 with two goals in mind, closing the achievement gap and providing a school of full inclusion. The instructional model was created after studying many high-performing schools, and what we found was alignment and consistency. The alignment was between leaders and staff in the implementation of best practices, and the consistency was in academics and behavioral standards for all students. We, you heard some of the, the instructional strategies, early intervention, we're, we're relying a lot on multi-tiered systems of supports. We recently were awarded a grant from Orange County for social emotional learning, um, an area of growth for us, but an area of urgent need for our students. I believe the model of education that Navigator adheres to, which has proven to eliminate the achievement gap, amongst subgroups of children and which provides a full inclusion special education program for students with all types of disabilities will benefit students in Watsonville. I know from examples of other great civil rights movements that great change can come from seemingly small steps. The lives of 180 students can be likened to the pebble in the pond. You guys have that choice whose ripples might come to mirror a change in thousands of students' lives. Small things come from small things come great, great changes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Andrea Hernandez. Last meeting, I spoke about our model. Tonight, I want to explain with you my why. Why do I want to be a part of the effort to open Watsonville Prep School? Why am I working alongside our wonderful parent volunteers who are fighting for this choice? And why am I so honored and so humbled to have been chosen to be the founding principal of WPS? 
Like all of you, I'm here for the kids. The future students of Watsonville Prep School are my reason, inspiration, and motivation. I know the impact we can have on, the, on their lives because I see it every day at Hollister Prep. I see the faces of my original class of kindergartners who are now fourth grade students reading on grade level and confidently leading guided reading discussions. I see the face of Gabriel who came to HPS as a as our founding second grade class, reading below a first grade level. Entering sixth grade, Gabriel scored advanced in both mathematics and language arts. This year, he is a student leader. He's a participant on our basketball team. He takes part in our public speaking elective, which has led him to speak in front of many different groups to advocate for Hollister Prep students. He also wanted to make sure everyone knows tonight that he's on the principal's honor roll. And this is not an isolated story. Our focus on data-driven instruction, coaching, daily intervention, and small group instruction makes a difference. The model makes us who we are, and the model allows us to be successful. As a former college athlete, I know the importance of teamwork. And with your support on the 23rd, we can come a part of your team, the PVUSD team, working together to provide the top quality education for all Watsonville students. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mariah Butron, and I'm a fifth grade teacher at Gilroy Prep School. I graduated from UC Santa Cruz Master's in Credentialing Program in 2015 with an unsettling idea that my first year of teaching would be comparable to a fraternity hazing. My cooperating teacher said that if my first year was anything like hers, I'd be shoved into a classroom with more responsibility than I'd know what to do with, and I'd be expected to just figure it out. My first year of teaching was three years ago, and it was nothing like that desperate picture that was painted for me. The administration and expert teachers at GPS ensured this by starting me off with a two-week professional development program known as NAVI 101. I was quickly immersed in the school's phenomenal culture, all while building relationships and collaborating with new and returning staff. I received systematic and intense weekly mentoring from an academic coach that was truly invested in me and my practice. Not one day went by where I wasn't receiving some type of in-the-moment feedback, and I never felt alone. Despite my class's diverse needs, including students with perceived de developmental disabilities, language barriers, socioeconomic disadvantages, my instruction in my first year of teaching resulted in 81% of my students meeting or exceeding standards. And last year, they got 93% on the SBAC. Over the next two years, that support never faltered. I no longer just receive weekly feedback on my teaching. I am now learning how to be a mentor teacher and have run my own professional development courses at Navigator as well. Navigator Schools is a phenomenal school and I am honored to work for them and to be part of their team. Thank you. Thank you. We didn't do this last time, that was a mistake. Hello, I'm James Dent, uh, one of the co-founders of Navigator Schools, and for the past seven years, Gilroy and Hollister Prep Schools have closed the achievement gap for low-income low Latino students. For decades, it's been the number one highest educational call in our nation, and it, it occurs so rarely that in some conversations, in some circles, the conversation has died out, but not at Navigator Schools. Just a week ago on Saturday, Navigator was honored as the Bay Area's top school for underserved students. You're seeing that report come to you now. GPS was number one in ELA and mathematics out of 729 schools serving a significant number of low-income Latino students. What do we do differently? We run engaged scholarly classrooms to get results for traditionally underserved students. Our students are well-behaved, positive citizens all over our campuses. Navigator is also mission driven. We're driven to help any and all organizations to close the achievement gap. You heard from Luis Carrillo, a retired GUSD principal. His school, Rod Kelly, a traditional district school with a unionized staff, has made the top 10 school list three years in a row because of their growth mindset, willingness to collaborate with Navigator, and learn from each other. It's why charter schools were created in the first place. I'm going to finish off with the Dalai Lama tonight. 
Just as ripples spread out when a single pebble is dropped into water, the actions of individuals can have far-reaching effects. I implore each of you, Board of Trustees, be that agent of change. It's a series of small things that can achieve the previously impossible. Give us a chance to be part of the solution in Watsonville with 180 students launching Watsonville Prep. Amazing things have started for much less. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the uh, visitor non-agenda items, public comment. And we'll go to item eight, employee organization comments. And 8.1 is PVFT. And good afternoon, Francisco Rodriguez with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, just wanted to uh, again acknowledge the uh, day of the teacher, congratulate um, all of the teachers and uh, those of you who were in, in attendance uh, um, earlier today, thank you for, for attending. Um, I wanna remind you as well that we have a very important uh, meeting uh, tomorrow uh, with fact finding. Uh, we are hopeful that um, you will take a uh, look at uh, your priorities and uh, make sure that uh, your teachers uh, have the uh, compensation and uh, working con uh, conditions that uh, we've been asking. Um, it's important that at this time uh, we work together. As you know, there are a number of organizations that um, are uh, looking um, to take advantage of additional funding that is provided uh, or meant to educate English language learners, to educate foster children, and to educate children uh, who uh, receive or are eligible for free and reduced meals. Um, un unfortunately, uh, it's easy to point out statistics. Um, it it uh, reminds me that uh, we here in our district uh, have several schools that have been uh, blue ribbon schools. Uh, they don't happen to be in the Watsonville area, as you know, uh, but we do have them. Uh, the the teachers said that those schools work under the same contracts that the teachers in Watsonville. They work under the same schedule, uh, salary schedule. They work under um, the same professional development programs, and the results are very differently, just like the zip codes, I guess. Thank you. And CSEA, welcome. Good evening, Board of Trustees, President DeRose, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Esther Murillo, and I'm the interim uh, CSA president for Chapter 132. I would like to give a brief report of what Chapter 132 has been doing lately. We have resumed our meetings with Dr. Rodriguez. We will be ratifying and voting next week with the Transportation Department on um, adding two days to the bus driver's calendar due to the fact that um, the first day of each semester is pretty hectic. The bus drivers are given new routes and the normal chaos. So thank you very much, Dr. Rodriguez, for your support in making sure this goes through. Next, our meetings, our weekly meetings with HR have been very, what do I want to say? It's been a really good experience for me. I've, I've received lots of support from Chona in helping making sure that I understand the process, also along with our labor rep. We've been dealing with numerous issues and they've been dealt with in a timely fashion. So thank you very much. Um, let's see. Negotiations will be starting for Chapter 132 next week on May 16th. We are hoping and know that um, we will start off on a positive note. Some of our um, members have shared some concerns in regards to the implementation of the new program that will be taking place, I, I believe, next school year, which is Synergy. I look forward to meeting with um, Mark Brewer and making sure that all our staff that come into hand and having to use that program are fully trained. 
Good evening. I'm Diana Martinez. I'm the treasurer for Chapter 132 and attendance specialist at EA Hall Middle School. Uh, Chapter 132 would like to express the gratitude to all the teachers of PVUSD. I uh, personally would like to thank the many educators who touch my own children's lives. For example, my daughter will be graduating from Cabrillo this May. Uh, as for my son, he started in special ed at four years old in SDC classes up until eighth grade. And um, there, was, there was guidance from Mr. Cannon at EA Hall who um, helped them advance three grade levels. So my son went from SDC to RSP in ninth grade. And at the end of my son's senior year, he mainstreamed all of his classes except for one, the federal government and economics class. And so, um, God willing, he will also graduate from Cabrillo next May. My children's accomplishments are also their teacher's accomplishments. I am forever, forever, ever, ever grateful and thankful to all of them. Thank you. Do we have anyone from uh, Pavam here tonight? Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uli Kumura at Radcliffe Elementary. Um, this has been really enlightening um, uh, tonight, and um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, collaboration and teachers working together as well. Um, we have a wonderful collaboration with um, technology and a technology TOSA, who has really propelled our school forward in terms of not just students using technology, but the integration of um, technology into the, you know, into our English language arts area, into our mathematics area. So right now we um, are, have the fortune of having uh, Medina Maldonado. She is a technology TOSA. We pay a quarter of her salary and uh, Ann Soldo pays the other quarter of her salary and technology graciously pays for half her salary, but we get her half time. So it's been really wonderful to have a person uh, on our site working directly with teachers. There's nothing like a coach on site where she can actually go into the classroom and work directly with teachers. So um, she does, of course, all her uh, charting of what she does is all um, uh, tracked electronically and she's made lots of wonderful charts and she couldn't be here tonight but um, she's done um, coaching she served 24 um, teachers during the first semester 32 teachers she's had 32 sessions with teachers from grades K through fri five including our reading intervention teachers and our librarian uh, she works directly uh, with students, modeling and alongside with teachers. Um, there's been uh, 42 sessions this second semester. Um, and she integrates um, you know, um, the technology into all the subject areas. The greatest impact has been into uh, English language arts and ELD. So it's, it's really... Um, it's a, a new way of getting teachers excited about using some of the same materials, but uh, presenting them in different ways, giving students opportunities to uh, share their knowledge uh, using technology, having second graders do a book report uh, live on TV, on camera, telling other students um, why they should uh, enjoy, why they would enjoy reading this book. We have students who are struggling students, but have an opportunity to demonstrate via technology what they've learned. So it's been really wonderful and we hope to continue this collaboration. So thank you very much and come and visit us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, CWA, do we have a representative from CWA? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move to item 9.0 and these are action items. Um, 9.1 is Summer in the City Internship Program. And this is a r report by Superintendent Rodriguez. Yes. So as I had mentioned to the board, we are doing many things to try to provide students with hands-on activities and internships. And so this is one of 
the two brand new opportunities that we have for students. So 21 high school students, um, this is the first phase. We'll increase it um, after this year if, if everything goes as we plan. And so we've been working with the city. We had a collaboration with them of about um, probably five months. So we met multiple times. Um, and what what we are so what is going to happen is the students will be able to come they will spend the day with our teachers learning about um, civic engagement learning about um, what it is to be a responsible citizen in a 21st century global environment and then they will spend the afternoon actually within one of the departments of the city so it'll be everything from parks and recreation to the um, to the managers um, city manager's office. Um, the city will be providing the $500 stipend to the student, so the funding, that funding will come from the city. What we are providing is 2.5% elective credit to our high school students because of the hours that they're doing in the morning. Um, we are also providing the transportation for students because we want to make sure that that's not a barrier. We're providing the lunches, um, and we are providing the two teachers. Um, and so we really um, work together to identify um, which budgets could apply, uh, could pay for which ones. Um, and we're really excited to start it. And um, next year, um, we'll roll out even more students and more locations. For this year, um, it's primarily our three comprehensive high schools um, that are receiving it. And um, we'll open it up to additional alternative high schools after following this year. Okay, great. Do we have any speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, and are there any questions or comments from the board? Yeah. Um, Michelle, have the candidates been chosen yet for the internships? No, we're still in the application process, and so we're going through. At this point, we still have spaces, so our college and career centers are working on it. So at this point, we don't want to tell the students, but at this point, if they've applied, then they um, are pretty much a shoe in. Um, but we're doing a second um, move forward. There is, they do have to do letter of recommendation. They also have to do an essay. So there is some elements involved in it, um, but the deadline is not passed yet. I think this would be a great opportunity, especially for our foster kids. Um, so I don't know if we could do a special reach out to that group of kids to offer this um, opportunity. Yeah, we certainly Thanks. can. We will. Thank you. So um, this is a great opportunity. And I'm wondering, are there plans for the college and career centers to work with the students following the internship program to show them how, how and where that should show up on their resumes? So the college and career centers are the ones that are doing the recruitment, so we definitely will know who those students are, and we can follow up with that for sure. Right, yeah, because that is definitely something that we know employers, this has been a barrier for students who come out of school with um, education but with no experience. That's employers are telling us, us that all the time, and um, internships are a known way to get um, their resumes up to the top of the pile because it shows experience and education. No problem. So I think it's great. We can consider um, it done. Thanks. Any other comments? I do. Um, so you mentioned that eventually will be expanded to include comprehensive and alternative. Mm -hmm. It includes comprehensive so far, but then it will be expanded to include also alternative schools. Exactly. Um, so what type of criteria do you look when students are selected? So right now you said, you know, it's, it's based on the application. So essentially if you apply, you're, you get in. And the letter of recommendation following the essay and so forth. Uh, but when it gets, let's say that you receive more than the 25 applications, how would then you select who will be participating in the program? Yeah, so I can I can provide it to you. There's actually a rubric in which um, provides one thing that is a criteria point is um, attendance. So we worked with students as well and did focus groups. We took off the requirement of the GPA because some of the students were mentioning to us that the very students that would like to be engaged in this may be disconnected from their school 
experience. And so another reason why we're doing both juniors and seniors is to look to re-engage students that maybe are not currently engaged in the process, but I can definitely provide you the rubric okay, so that great. you have it. Thank you. Uh -huh. I like that approach. Great. Thank you. I look forward. No, and will we get a report after the summer on how this went? Exactly. We'll even bring some students and do a presentation for you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. I'm really happy with that. I'd like to make a motion to support this. This is an action item, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is a wonderful program. I will second that motion. Okay. So we have a, a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Not surprisingly. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, item 9.2, and I think these next four are all Dr. Colleen, if I'm not <laughs> mistaken. This is a resolution acknowledging May 9th, 2018, as Teacher Appreciation Day, as we've heard many times throughout the evening. Go ahead, Dr. Chilling. Yes, Chilling. Uh, President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, it's an honor and a privilege to present this resolution for Teacher Appreciation Day. Great to visit sites and departments this week, seeing students, administrators, parents, classified staff, teachers, uh, themselves, community, celebrating the dedicated work of our teachers um, with a number of um, fun things. Uh, celebration breakfasts and luncheons, and I personally vouch for the cookies at the <laughs> dessert bar. Uh, I am on my 12, but I did save some for my PVFT president, Francisco Rodriguez. Um, he gets one. Uh, gift <laughs> cards, um, appreciation banners, cards, staff gifts, including teacher supplies. And um, there were some cool interactive posters with teachers' pictures on them, and students were writing messages, um, you oh. know, with messages from the students. And the resolution reads, uh, resolution declaring May 9th, 2018 as Day of the Teacher, um, whereas the contribution of the teachers is crucial to the lives of students of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. The economic, political, and cultural well-being of this nation is enriched through public education and its teachers. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District has over 1,300 certificated employees and the Board of Trustees and citizens of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District are gratified by the dedicated hard work of our teachers and now, therefore, it is resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District salutes its teachers and declares May 9, 2019, Day of the Teacher. And further resolved that the Board of Trustees urges students, parents, and community members to take measures to give special meaning to the significant celebration. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so are there any speakers to this item? None. And any? Well, um, actually, 9.2. Dr. Lupe Rivas. Hi. Hi, Lupe. Come on up. Well, thank you. Uh, hello, Dr. Rodriguez and the rest of the board members. It's nice to be here. Feels like a, a reunion here. But um, today I'm, I'm here. Um, I'm, I'm to represent California Retired Teachers Association. I am the current president of the Santa Cruz Division. And as a, as a retired teacher, I want to join you in honoring our teachers. Uh, I really appreciate the work they do and I, I don't think we could exist in the world without teachers. So I really uh, would like to join you and, and also to announce that uh, we used to give cookies to the teachers also, but uh, we decided it was a lot, a lot of work for some of our seniors to go out there to the schools. So we, this year we decided to give out teacherships and we've uh, designated 15 $100 uh, teacherships for teachers to use in any way they want to use them in the classroom, whether it's for supplies, for its field trips, whatever they want to use it for. So we would like for, to encourage the school district to make that announcement to the teachers to apply. They can contact me personally, or they can go to, on our Cal RTA website. Uh, there is a, a, a section there for teacherships. So thank you for supporting our teachers and honoring them. Uh, they do a lot of hard work, and I, I belong to, a, to the group that most of us are retired, but all of us are working in, in, in different capacities as volunteers, as substitutes. So we're teachers for a lifetime. We, we help in the community, and I still substitute. So I enjoy that part. And, and it's kind of nice to walk in, do your thing, and walk out. So it's nice. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And then Jeff. Kim and then Jeff. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. You first, Kim. Well, uh, you can make the motion. I'll second. Um, the I think this is wonderful. You know, 
of course we want to honor our teachers. It's the right thing to do. I'm married to a teacher, so of course I'm going to support this 100%. <laughs> um, my only concern is I, I really wish we could roll these kind of things out beforehand. It's a little bit, um, instead, of doing it, instead of doing it May 9th at 9 o'clock, I wish we could have voted on this oh, two weeks ago. And that way teachers could have seen, gotten the support two weeks. They've known they got our voice of support a week ago or two weeks ago. That's my only do better next time or do over as I think that we need to start voting on these things before they actually happen I'm so happy to see we're voting on a resolution that happens in May later on in the month um, in a few moments so of course I think this is a wonderful I think we need to honor our teachers they do do a lot of hard work um, but I I wish we could have given that support as a board or voted to acknowledge them two weeks ago I can see Willie's gonna say something to me I can see it on his face <laughs> Thank you. I think you should make a motion while you're. I will make a motion to approve Teacher Appreciation Day for May 9th. I'll second the resolution. And did you have a comment? No. No, just that we're so happy and thrilled to be bringing this forward and and support and have much much gratitude for the teachers in this district, including the retired teachers, and with much gratitude, Dr. Rivas, for your teacherships. I think that's a wonderful wonderful gift. Thank you. Okay, so um, we've got a motion and a second. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Of course, none. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Please share. You will, I know. Okay, item 9.3 is also a resolution, and um, this is in recognition, recognition of Classified Employee Week. Um, May week of it doesn't have a week of but I will let Dr. Colleen <laughs> yes uh, President DeRose board trustees Dr. Rodriguez um, taking a cue from uh, trustee Orsino um, we're presenting this a couple of weeks early um, so this is a resolution acknowledging May 20th to 26th as classified school employees week and my classified director Pam Shanks has been bugging me all week because she wanted to share this and present it into the board so I'm going to give her the opportunity to do so thank you very much um, I'm Pam Shanks the classified human resources director and um, when I'm tell people what I do for a living they say well at school districts everyone just thinks of teachers which are great and then they forget oh yeah we have almost a thousand classified employees that help support those teachers every single day um, and help support student learning from the bus driver in the morning who greets the student first thing to the cafeteria worker who serves them their lunch the office staff who helps them to the district office where we have um, human resources where we hire all of our employees to our finance department, our payroll department. There's a lot of work that goes into supporting our um, school district and our classified school employees are a very big part of that. So it's a privilege to talk to the public about what I do and what our classified employees do in the district and the support that they provide. So I am here to present that and also before they snuck out, Esther and Diana, um, I asked them to come up with me and if they would like to talk a little bit about Classified School Employee Week, we'll be celebrating that in a couple weeks. So we will be celebrating um, the 21st on Monday at the VFW. We're going to be having an ice cream social to celebrate our classified. Um, as Pam mentioned, we start the day off and we end the day helping our students and our children of our community, and we're very proud of it. Thank you very much. That's it. If we just ask you, um, do you want me to read the resolution? Okay, I will do that. Whereas the classified employees of the district support a positive instructional environment in a variety of ways each day, and whereas the contribution of classified staff are invaluable to the PVUSD. Whereas almost half of the employees of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District are classified workers, and whereas the Pajaro Valley Unified School District has almost 1,000 dedicated and hardworking classified employees. Now therefore it be resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District salutes its classified employees and declares May 20th through the 26th as Classified School Employee Week. And be it further resolved that the Board of Trustees of the PVUSD urges students, parents, and community members to take measures to give special meaning to this significant celebration. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Do we have any speakers to this item? We do not. Okay. And any um, any comments or or questions from the board? Okay. I'll entertain a motion. And I'd like to make a motion to support this resolution and thank all of our classified staff. We could not do it, do it without you. You guys are amazing. Thank you. I will second that motion. Okay, great. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And seeing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for everything you do. And next, um, item 9.4. Um, this is also a report prepared by Dr. Colleen um, on the addition of C Cesar Chavez Day holiday to the CSEA and PVUSD collective bargaining agreements. Yes, President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, we ask um, approval of the addition of the Cesar Chavez Day holiday to the CSEA PVUSD collective bargaining agreement based on the attached tentative agreement that was ratified by CSEA on March 2018. Um, this tentative agreement concludes the 2016-17 negotiations with CSCA. And the holiday is in honor of Cesar Chavez, who gave our nation and each of us a unique example to live our lives by, his, his selfless dedication for farm workers, economic justice, civil rights, environmental justice, peace, nonviolent, empowerment of poor and disenfranchised, uh, leave a monumental legacy that will empire, inspire all in the generations to come. Okay, thank you. Do we have any speakers to this item? No. And any questions, comments from the board? Oh, come on up. On it. Chapter 132 CSA would thank you very much for another holiday. <laughs> <laughs> any comments? Okay, I have a question first. So this isn't... It, Explain to me what happens after this. Does this go into, because isn't this negotiated if we're adding something to the calendar? So can you just explain what, what this um, would mean? This would be an additional holiday. Um, we listed all the 14 holidays um, for uh, CSEA, and this holiday will be uh, during spring break. Um, so it's, I think, the Friday or the Monday of, of, of spring when break. Be impacted. So would that be an additional day of pay for them? Yes. Because, okay. And this is for all bargaining units? Uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's scheduled for a hall. It's for CSCA because this was what we negotiated with CSCA. So it's um, just, you know, for the CSCA. But we will be honoring, we will be having the holiday for Cesar Chavez, um, you know, during the spring break. So it's another holiday for them. Okay. It, it does say... CSEA and PVFT, though, so I'm just... It's PVUSD. Oh, it is? Did I read that wrong? Ah, I did. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, okay, great. Any other questions? I have a comment. Go ahead. I think this is a really um, wonderful way to honor um, both our staff and um, the memory of Cesar Chavez, um, a, a great man who organized... Um, for the rights of many, many people. And we're grateful um, to his activism. And I'm very happy to support this resolution or this, is this a resolution or an action item? Action, action item, item to provide this holiday to our classified staff. So I'm in support. So do we have a motion? I, I'd like to make a motion. I think Willie had made the motion. Oh, Willie had made the Oh, I'm motion. sorry, okay, I'll second then, great. Okay. And any other? No? Okay. Um, seeing none, I will ask for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes unanimous. This is a really nice agenda tonight, isn't it? <laughs> this is great. So my kind of board meeting. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh-oh. Now I'm worried. Um, okay, item 9.5, and this is approving um, uh, a recommendation to approve of an MOU between Santa Cruz Silicon Valley New Teacher Project and PVUSD. 
Yes, President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, me again, uh, requesting approval of the uh, Memorandum of Understanding for the new teacher project in our school district. And the goal of this partnership between our district and NTP is to increase student achievement through the implementation of quality research-based teacher induction programs while nurturing the growth and development of participating teachers in the district in a sustained and systematic manner. Um, the partnership will allow us to conduct induction programs for our probationary teachers that meet legislatively mandated uh, requirements for state approved induction programs. Um, we are grateful for the board for approving the MOU um, with PVFT to compensate our teachers um, who have reached out um, earlier to our intern, uh, to teachers and in intern programs and those with teaching permits. And we will continue to f provide further support um, with our collaborative efforts with PVFT on the mentoring article, Great. in addition to the MOU. Okay, thank you. Any speakers to this item? None. Okay. Um, and any comments or questions? Question. Well, Is this the same uh, program as the um, UC run project that uh, we have been uh, with for many, many years? No, it's, uh, uh, it's Santa Cruz um, with um, Silicon Valley. It's the new teacher project. So it's a problem. No. It's there, there used to be one through. Yeah, yeah we, we, we had that uh, partnership with UC Santa Cruz, I believe. But, it, but it's not the same. Yeah, no, this is through the new teacher project, which we have used for years. Um, however, it's not through the UC system. Yeah. Okay. So just for, yeah, for clarification, because we're all confused about that, because we have used the, the new teacher project, always it's been hubbed at UC Santa Cruz. So for all of our leadership and our mentors and new teachers and all of that, it's run through UC Santa Cruz. So have we broken ties with that new teacher project? This is the same one. Same one. It's the same one. Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's moved over there. <laughs> it's moved or it's just a different... It's it's in, in it's independent of that. So it's um, both Silicon Valley and Santa Cruz, and it's the new teacher project that I've known since I've got here. So it's been in existence. Um, it's not linked to UCSC. Okay. It never was. No, I think it, it was. at least currently is not. I'm not sure the history of if and when it was connected. That would just be good to get clarification later because I, I'm confused. This is great. I mean, this is um, this is great, and of course I'm going to support it. But just for for curiosity, I'd like to know what was happening with that. Are there um, any more comments or questions from the board? Okay. Um, I'll uh, uh, motion. I'll make a motion. I'll. S Okay. For the new teacher project. Motion by Trustee Osmondson and second by Maria Os Orozco. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And item 9.6 is second reading of board policy on general obligation bonds. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez has this. Um, presentation. Yes, yeah, so this is um, this is a second reading of this. This is what I brought last board meeting in which everything that's in yellow is the new language that is required by the law. Um, and so there were there was a law which was passed um, which is um, AB 22116 um, and then also 2738, which required us to add additional language. This actually, the law actually passed in 2016. Um, however, we did not update our board policy as required. So one thing that has was, has, was requested by President DeRose was that each board me meeting I bring a, a board policy which needs to be updated, which is what we've been doing. So um, we bring it the first time as a first reading to give everybody the opportunity to look at it and then provide me input if they have any requested changes. All of it is done through gamut. So basically that is through the school board association, um, looks at the laws, um, 
identifies language which complies with that, and then we um, generally use their language, and in this case, we did. So anything that is struck out is past language, and anything that is highlighted yellow is the new, so that you can easily see what changes were made. And as you can see, we had to add quite a bit um, because we didn't have all the required language from those two laws. And are, are there, just a second, are there any speakers to this item? None. Okay. Karen? Yeah, so I move to approve the second reading of the board policy on the obligation bonds. Okay, is there a second? A second. And any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for bringing these forward. And um, report and discussion items, um, item 10.1 is Paro Valley High School football field and track project options, which is very exciting to see on our agenda, finally. Very big. So <coughs> our CBO, Joe Dominguez, is gonna give us this report. Thank you. Well, good evening, uh, members of the board. Um, this evening we're excited to present you know how we move forward with our project there's various uh, uh, public construction delivery methods and um, it's our role as a district and and my role to find the right fit to move a project forward and so this evening we want to uh, provide information uh, on uh, two um, delivery methods that we are considering um, this will be an action item at a future board meeting and in partnership with our facilities legal counsel, uh, we'll overview and review the delivery methods or options that we have. So with that being said, we have uh, Deidre Sakai with uh, Dennis Walliver Kelly, and uh, I'll let, hand it over to her now. Um, good evening. Um, let's see, starting with the project delivery method options for the football field and track project. Just a, as a general overview, the two project methods that we'll be talking about is the traditional project delivery method, which most people are familiar with. We also call it design, bid, build. That's the sequence in which it happens. Um, that's sometimes used with an option called CMAS. CMAS is the California Multiple Award Schedule, where the state does certain bids and uh, um, sets certain prices that public entities can use. And then the alternative is also um, to this project is lease, lease back. Um, this is just a diagram to show how the relationships are between the parties in design and build. As you see, districts in the middle and you have a separate contract with the architect, and then there's a separate contract with the contractor who then contracts with their subcontractors. There's an option for a construction manager, and it's not always applicable in every situation. Um, for procurement of, um, of design bid build projects, you have a situation where the architect completes the plans, that means DSA goes through it and approves it all the way through that, then it goes out to bid. Once it goes out to bid, it would be awarded to the lowest responsive responsible bidder, which is based only on price, and then what you have is a lump sum. So what we wanted to do, oh, so I'm sorry, I just wanted to go through this really quickly. This idea of California multiple award schedules is something that's set up, the DGS does bids, so that even if for the district it's a no bid contract, it has been bid by somebody else. And um, it's a lot of times used in conjunction with design bid build because if you can buy a portion of the project, Say for your field project, if you get the field through one of these CMAS contracts and that price is lower than you could get out on the market, there's a positive benefit in terms of price for the district. Um, but you can only use what's already been built or what's listed in the contracts. So depending on the scope of your project, you know, um, the, the, the buildings might be left out. So that might have to go out through design bid build as opposed to um, doing everything under CMAS contract or some other similar cooperative purchasing. Cooperative purchasing is sort of this idea where you have a lot of smaller school districts who wouldn't necessarily be able to get really good prices because you're not one of the big players. So you kind of all get together, they bid these things out, and the people who respond to it, they understand that they'll get more business by doing this, so they get better prices. 
And that's the way that districts often leverage their money to try to get the best price possible for the project because nowadays it's always really important. Um, I won't go through this now to use CMS contracts, but it's in there if you wanted to know the procedures for using it. Um, we we're comparing design, bid, build with lease, lease back. And I'm sorry I'm talking so quickly. I don't have a lot of time. And I want to make sure I get through all of this. Again, if you notice, the structure is very similar to design, bid, build. You have the district in the middle. You have a separate contract with the architect and a separate contract with the builder. And they have subcontractors, trade contractors that they work with. So the idea of lease, lease back, it, it's a name that's bandied about all the time. And nobody really stops explaining what that means. What happens is that at the beginning, the district um, does a site lease to the builder for $1. And then in exchange, the, the builder builds tenant improvements on that lot. And when it's completed, they lease back the completed tenant improvements to the district. That's the general structure of what it is. Um, you know, there's a lot of, it's, it's come a long way from the initial thought of what it was before. It was, it was a way to have the developer finance the construction. Today, nobody really has the developer to finance, you know, like 100% of the project. That's almost unheard of. Um, so there is a lot of questions about lease, lease back, because there is a case that came out in 2015. It was Davis um, versus Fresno Unified School District. Up until this time, all of the cases up, had upheld the legality of lease, lease back. And it, not that Davis said that um, lease, lease back contracts are illegal, but they said that they wanted to look at certain factual issues when it goes to trial. This case was decided on a demur. And for people who aren't lawyers, it means it was based only on the facts in the complaint. There was no proving up of the facts. So right now, until it go, it's back in trial court and until it's done, there's not going to be any final decision on it one way or another. Davis versus Fresno Unified is an appellate court case. So the two things that really came out of it was they try to say that to use lease lease back, you have to have um, financing as part of it in order for it to be a genuine lease. And then the second part of it really involves the conflict of interest because the way that lease lease back contracts were done is you had a preliminary services agreement before you entered into the leases so that you could get input from the builder and um, which was a benefit to the project. And the reason why we had to split it up is because um, the Field Act requires that you have DSA-approved plans before you enter into a contract for construction. So we couldn't put it together. Um, I just wanted to note, after Davis versus Fresno, there's been two cases, McGee versus Balfour Beatty, which is Torrance Unified School District, and California Taxpayers Action Network versus Tabor Construction, which is Mount Diablo. They've kind of held the opposite of Davis, where it said that you need to have financing in order for it to be a genuine lease. But the issue that remains consistent is the idea of a conflict of interest. So what the legislature did is they passed AB 2316. And um, so Education Code 17406, which was the lease lease back statute, used to be like one paragraph. That's all it was. So there was no rules. And any people could make up whatever rules they wanted. And what happened is the legislature went back, and a lot of the things that were brought up in the, the litigation were addressed. So now they set up um, very specific pre uh, selection procedures because a lot of people said, oh, it's no bid. Some people did do RFPs, request for proposals anyway, which is a competitive selection. Now the legislature requires that. They require it to be advertised. Um, they brought in stuff regarding um, listing rights or subcontractors. A lot of the things that um, were brought up in the, in the litigation, and an important thing that they did is that for lease lease back, they provided a situation where districts can enter into the contract early before DSA approval so that you can get the benefit of having constructability review of your plans or value engineering, um, but you don't have to wait for DSA to approve the plans already in order to do that. And they put a safeguard in there. You can't start building until DSA approves your plans. So although you enter in early and you get the benefit of the builder's input, you can't start until um, the plans are approved. OK, so I kind of went through um, some of the lists here of things about procurement. Like I said, um, one thing I did want to point out is when you compare it to design, bid, build, as soon as you get the bids from the design, bid, build, almost immediately you start shoveling the dirt. 
with lease leaseback, you can get into your contract earlier with the builder, but until DSA approves the plans, you have to wait too. So it, it's, it's like a two-step process because you enter into the contract without having a set guaranteed maximum price. What you have is usually what we call price points, and it's the margins, it's a fee for service that the developer charges you. And it, after the um, DSA approves the plans, they bid the subcontracts. And then the margin that you negotiated earlier is applied to those subcontracts. And that's how your guarantee maximum price is put together. So, you know, in terms of it's faster to get into a contract with lease leaseback, but you won't find out about, you're finding out about the prices about the same time and shovel to dirt roughly around the same time. Um, so some of the advantages of lease leaseback is that it's a best value selection. So it's not based on price alone. It can be price, um, technical experience, and safety. Those are the required minimums. But I've had seen other people put in things about schedule, what kind of subcontractors to use. There's a lot of different other factors that people can add into the situation. Um, for lease leaseback, there can be more cost control. Um, because of the fee for services where you have the margins and when you negotiate certain things, it's, it's, it's standardized. If you have a lump sum, you don't know if the general contractor marks up 15% on one sub and 5% on another. You know, it's just a set um, even percentage. Um, there's, it helps with schedule control because sometimes what happens after you bid the documents and the contractor looks at it, they find things in there that there might be um, that need to be either addressed in the plans. If you get into it sooner, it won't delay your project later on. That's kind of part of the benefit of getting early builder involvement. Um, and then the last thing is that just generally, I mean, this is, I don't have any statistics on it. Some of the people who I work with who use it, they really like it. I also work with people who use design, build, build, and they're happy with that too. It's just a matter of opinion for some people. I mean, because the idea of lease lease back is supposed to encourage partnership, so that there's less, um, um, you're less split on sides between the district and the contractor. Some of the challenges with lease lease back is that there's a skilled and trained workforce requirement, and really what that is is it's about having a certain number of. Um, journey persons who work on the project who've graduated from an apprenticeship program that's certified by the state. There's already some, you know, there's a certain level of apprenticeship require, um, require, and journeyman requirements in the labor code already just to do a public works project. This is kind of a higher level. And then um, for lease, lease back, oftentimes when you get the initial contract where you negotiate the price, the price is higher and then throughout the project, because you, you catch the, change, the potential change orders up front, so you negotiate it because you have it all at one time, as opposed to design, bid, build, where you don't find out about it at, until you go along throughout the project. So the only way to really see which one is higher is to compare them at the end, because up front is not going to be same. If you're just to do design, bid, build, and you bid it out, that price is probably going to be lower than doing a GMP for a lease, lease back. Um, and then if you do lease these back, there is the potential for legal challenges. Um, design did build as the traditional default method for doing construction. Um, people don't challenge that. I mean, they do challenge, they have challenged um, lease lease back, but I haven't heard of any new, new litigation after the statute's been changed um, because it does give a lot more um, procedures that address the, th the items that people in the litigation were bringing up. Um, so when we talk about projects that are suited to lease lease back, um, where it, it's where experience is more important than the lowest cost up front. Um, and I think we've talk I've, ta I've touched on that a little bit. Um, when you have um, occupant scheduled occupancy is critical because you have more co uh, schedule control, I'm sorry. And then if cost control, not the price itself, is important that it, when it's critical, that's when you'd like to use the lease lease back. And, um, and for some people, it's a less adversarial structure. Okay, projects that are less suited to 
least least back or the kind of projects that are very rote or um, that you do them all the time. They're very building classrooms. These are things that you guys do all the time, and there's a certain amount of experience already. It's about doing it, so it doesn't require um, a lot of expertise, not expertise, but that same kind of expertise. Um, and then it's just sort of the opposite of the other stuff where I said where cost control isn't as important as important or if you having the project done at a critical time isn't as important. And that's kind of the yeah, end, sorry. Well, that was great, thank you. So the general overview for for the within the presentation uh, myself and facility staff along with uh, facilities council will be bringing a recommendation at the next board meeting uh, for approval to proceed. Um, and in the overview, you see some of the benefits and the pros of both delivery methods. Um, right now, we need to confirm uh, with under the CMAS um, delivery method, is the football field covered under that? And if that's a yes, then are the portables also included in that? So that's kind of the big question mark there. Um, with lease lease back, we can also uh, go out to bid prior to getting DSA approval. But then once DSA plans are approved, then we can go out and move forward but we could start the process earlier. So that's where we're uh, analyzing that internally. Okay. So I just want to make a point that originally the project was already DSA approved. However, you will, remem you will remember that through conversations we've had, we had to make significant changes um, with working with the city. So we submitted our plans on December 9th. And between December 9th and the April, where they approved it, we were required to make significant changes. Those significant changes required us to resubmit to DSA. And so that, um, that means that um, that's why we're bringing this to you tonight, because we, you know, it is one thing that we need to consider. Also, uh, predictability and being able to schedule, predictab pred schedule predictably um, is very important because of the fact that we are in the coastal zone. And so there is a significant time period in which we cannot do specific times types of engineering and construction. And so we do need to be able to very much plan out and predict the schedules so that we can move um, the project forward. So I wanted to, to make that clarification because as you all knew, um, we originally had submitted to the city our DSA approval, um, but we had to resubmit because of the significant changes that we were asked to make. Okay. Um, are there speakers to this item? No. Okay. Questions, comments from the board? Can Let me ask a question. Uh, let's go. Okay. Willie, Maria, and Kim. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, who who asked us to make the uh, changes? Postal Commission or? Um, no. So city staff um, thoroughly reviewed it and worked with their engineers and in turn worked with our engineers. Um, so all those changes were done. Um, so that we could receive a positive staff recommendation from the city. Was that was that was that before or after we uh, made the presentation to the city, and the city uh, basically said okay unless the pilots are uh, not going to sue us. So that was the, I believe you're talking about the original conversation, which was the auditorium. And so we, that conversation has been put on hold. Um, we didn't, want, what we did is we put that on hold to then do phase one with the Pilots Association, which included the athletic field. So we didn't do a technical presentation. We submitted the required documentation for the permit. Um, and then there was several months of back and forth. And as I had mentioned before, um, Victor and his um, and his team worked um, many weekends in order to do the requirements. So one of the things that we were required to do is reverse engineering, um, which usually takes three to four months. And Victor worked with um, staff and our consultants and did it in four weeks. Um, and so, but it is those very changes that were required of us that required us to go back to DSA. So. Really quick, let me just ask, how long do you think it's going to take to get DSA approval on the changes? 
though Joe would probably be able to answer that better. Uh, the estimate that we got from our architects is about 45 days. Oh, okay. um, in that meantime, within that window, we would style, uh, come back to the board for recommendation to move forward. And so that's the other component is while we're waiting, um, we're doing something. And so um, that's what we like to bring forward at the next meeting. Maria? Yeah, just really quick. I'm just curious. Would um, project labor agreements be something that we can consider? Um, yes, that's something that districts review and um, throughout the state um, review and assess um, by district. So that's something that we can look at. Um, in some districts, um, it's always in discretion to the district, but that's something that districts can look at. Yeah, so when you're bringing it back, I would like more information on that. Yeah. Um, can I just say, though, I mean, if you wanted to move this forward quickly and we can get you all the information you want on project labor agreements, it usually requires a negotiation. So, I mean, it doesn't, it's not something that um, gets done quickly, like in a month or something like that. It usually takes a longer period of time. Well, along with the report, I would like a time frame of how that could potentially look like. I just want to see what options we have. Will do. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I'm on. Um, so we have architects. We've paid tremendous amounts of money to design, redesign. We've submitted. We've filed for fees. We've submitted again, filed more fees. So it, the design is done, right? We, we don't need to do this, these other. Actually, through the, the city permitting process and the Coastal Commission, there's addendums. So we had to add or redesign. I wouldn't say a full redesign. Well, right, but, but it's been redesigned now and submitted to the DSA. Correct, and now we right. have to make additional edits to okay. that. Okay, yeah. so the other thing is when we when we passed Measure L, we made a promise to the voters that we would try as hard as, as we could to use um, local firms to do all, most of our builds here in this district. We've really not had to date any report back to this board on how what the percentage of work that's been done to date under Measure L the percentage of local firms that have been used. So I think I'd like that. I'd like to see that come back um, potentially to the board or definitely to the oversight committee because I'm not sure that we get a regular report on that. But is it possible to use anyone local to build the football field? Uh, it depends on the, the delivery method. Um, there is negotiated items um, that we can take um, in some scenarios where you request a portion of the um, the local market to be used. Um, so that's something that we can like look at. Like the subs and everything, yeah. Correct. Okay. Um, so that was a very lengthy legal presentation, which was, I think, over my head for sure. And I was pretty zoned out in it. And I think you guys coming back with what recommendation the administration would have for us would have been more helpful than having to sit through this presentation about this and that and this and that, which I have no foundational knowledge about, so it was not helpful for me as a board member, just FYI. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. So the, the uh, subject tonight is lease, but lease, lease back versus the other options. So if we pass Measure L, and we have the money, is it, is it now a question of which of these two methods is, is the most advantageous for us to use that money and maintain control of the project? Is that, is that what we're talking about? Yes. Oh, it, it's, yes, and it's what delivery method best fits the project, given the concerns of, um, in either scenario, timeline, cost, and scope and the relationship um, to get that done. Okay, so, so, so the question that we have is which of these methods would be used to build the foot, uh, football field the fastest? Is, is that? That's the next step for, that we're evaluating right now. Um, we just wanted to inform the board that these are the two that we are looking at. One of the question marks is that under the CMAS component, the can the entire project be covered under that delivery method? One of the things that we have to still dig into is the, um, the work on the portables 
and the um, I, a portion of the parking lot on the upper yard uh, area. Um, and then lease lease back, it can all be covered within that. Um, so we're looking at those components. Is, is the a sense of urgency here that we want the field ready by football season? That's so both of them would also have the now we talk about the timeline have an impact on our timeline <coughs> of the project So mm -hmm. that's something else that we're also working with the architect saying if we chose this path and delivery method What does that timeline look like and what does it look like if we chose this other scenario? And what's that timeline look like? Okay, fair enough. Okay, so uh, We would expect these answers by when by by the next board meeting by the next board meeting Summer's almost here. We got to start working on that field. <laughs> yes, we do. So just really quick. I'm sorry. We, we had a little bit of confusion here. You went from the field to portables. Are they, those two separate projects? No, it's the same project. Okay. Um, there are some um, portables located by the track okay. that also have to be relocated. And so it's part of that scope. Oh, got it. Okay. So, so if you remember when we had the initial first challenge, we tried to, in order to get a regulation track and field, we were trying at first to go up on the easement and to use a portion right. of the easement. And so we went to the Coastal Commission and they said absolutely not that it is um, for in perpetuity that we could never use that easement. So what we had to decide to do was to take out a portion of the hill that that's right there. So if you look at the field and you're looking at it from like the the road, what's uh, those portables that are up there and that hill that's right there um, would be taken out. Got it. Um, so those portables would need to be moved and we've already have a location identified, but we'd have to move those in order to be able to have enough space and not touch the it. easement. Thank you for that clarification. Are there any more comments or questions? Okay, well, thank you for that presentation. I appreciate you coming. And um, we look forward to the recommendation and follow-up information at the next meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next item is a um, re report on the state seal of biliteracy. And we have Dr. Gottlieb here to give us this presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, good evening, President DeRose, Superintendent Rodriguez, and trustees. I am here to give a brief report on Pajaro Valley Unified School District and the state seal of biliteracy. So as was mentioned already, yes, last night or yesterday evening, we had our ceremony to recognize our students, our graduating seniors who qualified for the state seal of biliteracy. And we also took advantage of the occasion to recognize our elementary um, language ambassadors who are elementary students who are on the way to becoming bilingual. So it was an opportunity for them to go to the Mellow Center, to be on stage, to be recognized, and also to watch the graduating seniors get their medals. So that was very exciting. In order to get the state seal of biliteracy, students have to demonstrate high levels of proficiency in English and another language. And these uh, qualifications are set by the state and you have them in the PowerPoint. But they are high standards. So I just wanna emphasize that. If the primary language of the student is other than English, the student also has to demonstrate English proficiency on the state assessment of English proficiency. So when we, we always wanna look at our numbers. So I have here the numbers, um, how the high schools did for 2018. You can see Aptos High 18, PV High 55 students qualified, and for Watsonville High 36. Um, and we have eight students that are waiting for their AP exam results. So and one or two students who are waiting for a certain grade in the second semester uh, for one of their classes. So when those, if, when those students um, meet those requirements, they can come back and get the seal and the medal. They still qualify. They just don't qualify in time for graduation. And you can see we have 107 students in English and Spanish and two students in English and Tagalog this year. 
too. <laughs> I thought it would also be interesting to look at the number of students we have who are current or former English learners. So this is kind of a new classification from the state talking about ever ELs or ever English learners. And these are students who were at one time or currently English learners. So they are students who are now English learners, who were English learners and have been reclassified as fluent English proficient. So when we look at the numbers and we do um, you know, a little subtraction, we can see that 11 students from Aptos High, <coughs> excuse me, would be considered English only students, right? And four students from PV High, five students from Watsonville High, and three from the, uh, the pending students are students who came to school speaking English <coughs> and learned another language. So I thought that was, that was worth mentioning. And all the other students came in speaking another language and maybe another language and English and received a, a high level of proficiency in that other language as well. I have our numbers here so you can see a little trip down memory lane. Um, I know that I stated in the blurb that our district was the first to award the seal of biliteracy in the county and you can see how our numbers have grown uh, from 2012 when we had 45 students to right now and we're looking at 117 for this year. That's my report, I know it's quick. Thank you so much, that's great to see that growth and um, I hope more students, we continue to see that growth. It's just gonna be better for them in their future years. Um, do we have any speakers to this item? No. no. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Karen? I was just gonna say that um, we're not only the only district in the county, but we were one of the first districts in the entire state that had a, um, you know, that, had, that, that did this whole seal of biliteracy because we actually did it before the legislation was passed in order to do it. We did it before then. So we were very good at doing that. I remember I was really trying to do it back in the day when we were working on getting it done, yeah. So, yeah, we, we were not one of the, we're not just the first in the county. We were one of the first in the whole state. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and I just want to add, if I may, on, on what Karen said, I'm sorry, that when uh, Susan Perez and Hilda uh, Nogueta brought this program to, to the board, Susan, I wasn't I wasn't sure about this thing as you probably recall, and it and it actually turned out to be one of the best mot um, motivational programs th over the years, and and I think that this is one that worked. Uh, thank you for bringing it. Right. You're welcome. <laughs> so, you know, I'm looking at the numbers of students that we've had over the years, and we're actually down this year, so we're not as high as last year. But it, it seems like we have so many kids that are actually more eligible for the sale of biliteracy. Is there a reason that more kids don't actually go for this? Not that hard. Well, it is It is a high level. I mean, when, oh, let's see if I can. It's like a 2.0 grade back. point average. It's not very high. 3.0. Well, it's a, it's a 2.0 in English. Answer. Right. It's a 3.0 in the foreign language if they qualify through four years of the foreign language. And they also have to have or a three or higher on the AP test, or they can also get a 600 or higher on um, the SAT. So it is a high level of proficiency in both languages. We also have um, that they have to have met the standard on the SBAC in 11th grade. So, for example, some of the, the students who, were, who are waiting to see, um, we have a couple students who need to have an A in their, it's actually for Spanish, uh, for the second semester, and also they're waiting for the results of their AP tests. Is that it, Kim? Ed, Maria? Okay. Because 600 is pretty high. Too. Just uh, piggyback on, well, I think this is an excellent program, let me say that. Um, but to piggyback on what uh, 
came and asked about. To me, I would think that over the years, it will be far more improvement as far as the numbers of students who receive the seal by literacy. So if we look in 2012, there, there's been a constant increase throughout the years. So I'm wondering what was done differently then um, that maybe we're not doing now or areas in growth as far as how we as a district can support these students to ensure that they get the opportunity to receive the seal by literacy. Right, and I think that would be, um, you know, at the high school level with the counselors and with the students. I know that there was a change in the, uh, for some of the years it was the KC, and now that the level of English proficiency is higher that the students have to demonstrate on the, on the SBAC. So there have been a few changes over the years. But I agree, you know, we have many, many students who come into our school speaking languages other than English and to really encourage them to become multilingual. Right, and so what would re your recommendations be as far as ad if it's promoting, you know, this I think program? it's promoting. I think it's having a stronger push. Um, it's something that we've also started doing with the language ambassadors, right? So now the students in elementary have that, and they say, well, we saw those, those seniors getting those medals, so we also hope that that's going to be an incentive for them. The, the superintendent wanted to chime in here just one second. Go ahead. So I was going to piggyback on the language ambassadors, and if you saw how many students um, in fifth grade received their medal for the pathway, for already being on the pathway, also um, we are going to be bringing back later um, part of the A through G change of trying to change um, the requirements for our students is looking at using their assets that they're bringing. So right now, a student does not have to take foreign language. They can choose between taking one year of, foreign, of language other than English and then one year of VAPA. And we're really looking at changing that and looking at increasing that so that the students are in fact taking a language other than English and it's it's not really just for the seal of biliteracy of course it's because we know in the global community that bilingualism and multilingualism is important um, but that will definitely spearhead it so not only do we have kids that are at the lower grades that are having aspirations towards that but we're also setting up the system to where they can take those classes and then get themselves to AP Spanish um, because right now we're not. The third thing I'd say is, is with the creation of the second dual immersion school, we're looking towards really creating that true pathway so that we have biliterate students so that they're taking not only AP language, but also AP lit, which will help to really get um, their AP scores up and then increase the number of students as well. Thank you. Jeff? Well, I, I, after M Michelle, uh, said kind of what I was hoping to hear is we really need, need to differentiate the experience. If we really want to build a successful biliteracy program, the SEAL biliteracy program, we really need to make these kids feel special. I, so I think this, the SEAL is great in the senior year of high school, but it really starts in fifth grade, right? That's when we differentiate that experience for those kids so kids want it, they aspire to it. That's when you're really going to start to see the growth in numbers. What I'm so glad you didn't say and because I, I was worried I was going to hear from somebody, is we need to keep those standards high. We need to have kids shoot for the highest standards they can. And when you can differentiate the experience and yet still have very high standards, that's when you're really going to see a difference. So thank you for your work. Um, I, in my personal opinion, that's how you do it, Start with kids in the fifth grade. And it's just, it's starting with kin TK and kindergarten students. And that's so. even better. And that's better. even better. So great. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank okay, you so thank much. You. We appreciate it. Um, so uh, that was just a report and, and discussion item, no action. So we'll move on. Next is the PVOSD employee recognition. And this is, I would think, Dr. Me again. <laughs> President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, I would like to call upon Pam Shanks, our HR Director, to come back uh, to share the activity plan for the upcoming employee recognition. Good evening. 
Um, I'm here to present um, the item for uh, employee recognition that we do annually in our district. Um, recognizing and honoring employees of the district is one of the board's uh, fundamental goals. Um, employees who have worked for a, a remarkable number of years for the district are, are to be commended for their service and we will be honoring them again this year. Um, by recognizing employees who have reached different milestones um, with their employment with the district, um, starting with 10 years, 15, 20, and so forth. Um, during the week of May 21st, we're gonna be honoring our employees with um, for their years of service with the lapel pin and certificates that will be um, sent out to their site so that their site um, coworkers and administrators can honor them for their years of service. Um, additionally, we'll be holding a special recognition for those who have served for 40 years in our district. And we have about seven people who have served for that number of years in our district. And I just want to make a note also that five of those seven are classified employees. So it really shows the dedication of our um, classified staff in our community. <laughs> Um, and so the uh, reception will be on Wednesday, May 23rd. There's actually, um, the time is wrong in the board backup. It's actually gonna be at 3.30 um, in the boardroom. It's not five o'clock as it's noted in there. So if you can just make a note of that change, um, you will also be sent um, that information um, as well. So you'll get the correct information, but it'll, it will be May 23rd in the boardroom um, and you're all welcome to attend. So I'm... Um is it going to be here or at the district office? At the district office. Okay. So yes. and it's, so after yes. that <laughs> celebration, then the board members would come here for the board meeting. Yeah, it'll be from probably about an hour or so, um, so 3.30 to 4.30. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and that's where we will also be um, honoring our retirees uh, this year as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a, a great um, celebration every year. Um, so thanks for doing that. And I, I'm always so impressed with the number of um, long-term employees that we have here, it's just amazing to me. So it says a lot about this district. Yes, so for the um, the numbers this year, we're gonna be honoring about 300 employees that have hit those milestones, the 10, 15, 20, et cetera, so. Right. Mm -hmm. um, are there speakers to this item? None. Okay, and are there any more comments from the board? No. Okay, great, we look forward to it. Okay, um, our next item is our wellness policy. Mark Brewer, Assistant Superintendent for Secondary. Good evening, President DeRose, members of the board, and Dr. Rodriguez. It's my pleasure to present to you this evening the wellness policy update. Um, we're required every three years to update the policy. Included in your packet is the work that was done by Linda Liu. She did most of the editing and gathered input from the Consolidated Health Committee that works through the district, as well as administrators, and then updated the policy we shared with you tonight, areas in red with a striped line through them, which are areas that were removed from the policy, and then areas that were added and updated in the policy are noted in blue on the document. So we wanted to present that to you and let you have time to review that and ask any questions about the process or input. Um, I'd invite Linda to come up to the podium in case you have specific questions for her. And also, we've kind of transitioned Joe into this process um, as well, moving forward. So three years from now, he will work to coordinate the update. So we just wanted to present it to you and get your feedback or um, answer any questions you might have at this point. Okay. Are there any speakers? I'm assuming no, no I don't see cards. Um, okay. And are there any questions, comments from the board? I see none. Yeah, you don't, yeah, I have one. Okay, you got to say yes or no. Sorry, I was yes. nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't tell unless you don't say say something. Go ahead, Jeff, and then Karen and Kim. We had a couple years ago, and I don't I don't know if this plays into this, but we had a couple years ago. Um, I had a, a discussion. I remember it as heated, with. Um, your predecessor, I believe, about cupcakes in school and birthday cakes and all that. And Susan's nodding her head, so it was heated. I'm not wrong. And 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 the other piece of this is that there's a there's a lot. I remember a lot of fundraising on campus with food. People sell cupcakes, whatever they may sell. It seems to me that we are that we are still under those constraints. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Linda Liu. I'm the Director of Food and Nutrition Services. Hi, Linda. How are you? Thank you. Good. Was I directed to the wrong person? Uh, no, no. Linda can answer okay, directly Linda. to that yes. and the fundraising component, but it's a good question. Thank you. 
And I believe I was at that board meeting where you had the discussion. It was heated, wasn't it? Uh, no, I wasn't the director oh. at the time. Yes. <laughs> um, so we have, I would say, uh, in speaking with the principals and getting feedback about the wellness policy, that some of the biggest questions revolved around the two things you just brought up right now. So um, I would say classroom celebrations and a fundraising. So a lot of that feedback was taken into um, some of the revisions in the wellness policy now. Um, what I did was, um, because the wellness policy rules are passed through from USDA through uh, CDE in the Nutrition Services uh, Division, uh, which is where most of my training uh, is coming on wellness policy, you know, final rules. So all of those rules um, I'm receiving through um, trainings and all of that uh, federal and state required rules are are in the language um, of the wellness policy and um, I did explain to everyone that um, took part <clears throat> in a feedback on the wellness policy that um, things that are given to students um, are not part of those rules and so what we decide about some of the rules regarding classroom celebrations meaning things that we have parents bring in or what um, teachers may provide um, free to students is a local policy. And so actually there was a decision to loosen some of the language and that was part of the updates to this policy. Um, however, I, it is still, there's most of the language is there, um, but it's been loosened to, um, I think, give principals and teachers um, the ability to maybe kind of uh, allow certain events, but um, still ha not have their school overrun with cupcakes on a daily so basis. We've moved to the middle, is what Correct. I'm hearing you yes. say. And I, th and I think that's good, because I do think you don't want to go overboard. Right. I think the other, but uh, on, I think that's good to hear. The, I know there's some concerns around peanut allergies, which I don't remember as a kid, and some other things. So we need, we need to make sure that our, all of our students are safe. But at the same time, if, if, you know, if a, a parent wants to bring cupcakes on somebody's birthday, I don't want to make that into a federal offense over. So thank you. Thank you for listening to what's going on and giving the, the local sites some, um, some flexibility. So, so just as an example, if you um, look at page 6F, which talks about fruit, food awards, rewards, um, that shows you what was put in previously and what we took out. For example, it used to just say school staff will be instructed to not use food as a reward. Um, and now it's as a general rule, should not. Um, we also changed it limited to one time per month to one to two times a month. And then we also, instead of high sugar items are not allowed, it's are discouraged. Mm. Okay. Um, so you'll see that that's, um, that's just a concrete example of how we, we tried to meet in the middle, but still do what's in the best health interest of our students. And I would say even though you're, you're feeling um, relieved, you know, that maybe some of the language is loosened, I also get that feedback from, you know, certain parties that they're very upset about it. So I think to them I say, to them I say for school sites that want to support, um, you know, the, the stricter version, they definitely have all the power to do that. Um, and then the sites that, are have, that would have an issue implementing this right off the bat, um, have a little bit of leeway and you know, can, you know, can kind of work that in. So I think it's a good starting point um, for everyone to, like you said, meet in the middle. I think the flexibility is really important. You're right, if there, if there are, if a school site really does, really has which a problem I have heard, with some yes, of these issues, which I have heard. and if they want to be stricter, mm -hmm. Right. That's fine, but some school sites want the flexibility. Maybe they don't have some of the issues that are trying to be addressed here. Then give them flexibility. I think that's a perfect solution. Okay, and Karen? Um, I heard that, you know, that they were going to try to, I don't know why I heard this, but they were going to try to do it so that um, children's birthdays, they would do them, all the children that had birthdays in one month, they would maybe do it on one day of the month as opposed to all the children's birthday bringing the cakes, the cake, whatever, all the children. I don't know why I've heard this, but that they would uh, do a birthday for all the children that had their birthdays in that month. Yeah. I mean, and I, so then they right. can 
so that the cakes, so they're not bringing cakes th three or four or five or six times a month. They're just bringing cakes or cupcakes one day, and they're going to celebrate all the children that had their birthdays on that one month. So, Karen, on item F on the second paragraph, it does mention that. It says classroom celebrations for holidays, birthdays, or other events will be limited to one to two times a month. So they can do that. Oh, so, 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 so they, they are say, addressing that. Oh, the, yeah, because I th maybe I read it here, too. Okay, but I've heard people talk about that, but it's, I probably read it. I read this, too. I'm sure I probably read that. Right. Yeah. So that's a that's a what I think is a is a very good idea to me. I think that's a really good idea, and then you know you're just limiting the amount of sweets to one day a month as opposed to a lot of days. <laughs> yes, yeah. for someone that celebrates uh, their um, their staff uh, birthdays um, in the office, when we have uh, week after week and uh, that I'm doing birthday <laughs> events, I also think about that. You know, is there a way I can just combine them into once a month? But um, but yeah, I think that's I can only imagine for a teacher with that many students and and you have every almost every day covered for the month. So um, celebrating by month is a great way to to kind of model that um, sweets are treats and there's definitely a place for them in your life, but it does not mean that it's a daily thing that you eat. And I think that's part of the modeling. Or once that a week happen. even, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, but I, I, I'm trying to think, did all of you, I can't remember exactly what the letter said, but I got a letter from a teacher about, about the food. And it was about something about something about some kind of plastics that you that we use to cover them that are very toxic. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember? Did you get that letter? Not that I recall. Letter from a teacher that talked about food and oh, talked about yes. You got that letter? Well, yeah. And he, he was talking about something about plastic. <coughs> we got a complaint from toxic. a student that the that all. Um, that the food that is heated up in the cafeteria ovens is all completely ensconced in plastic, and he didn't feel like that was very healthy. Yeah, something like that was really super unhealthy. And he, th he thought the plastic that used was pretty even toxic, and that you know we need to figure is out that, something to do so that the food's not. Is that something you can speak to? Are there any regulations around the kind of plastics that are used? Uh, anything that we use is definitely food grade level, so there there should not be any issue with that. We we do hear um, issues with packaging. I sh actually hear more about issues with packaging and waste in general, and not about any toxic level of of a uh, you know, wrap that we use. And I, and I kind yeah. of thought, whoa, I kind of agree. well, maybe maybe yeah. I agree with what he's saying. That doesn't sound good. I just remember le reading his letter and thinking. Right. Any anything that we're procuring is is all through mostly the the typical child nutrition uh, companies that all the you know local district all of the districts um, use, and so they're all definitely safe and food grade. But um, part of the reason that anything is uh, is covered is just for protecting health, actually. <laughs> so um, any kind of food cannot be any kind of food cannot be served um, open. Um, unless there's, um, if you have a kind of covering over the area, if there's kind of a safe way to, to serve it open, but when you're, um, set, you know, portioning out food and then if there's any kind of transport, like our elementary schools um, are satellited out from uh, the district office to 15 elementary schools, so in that case, food cannot remain exposed and so, so that, that's the reason for sorry that. to interrupt you but I think we we get the idea on that I'm just concerned was this student's concerns addressed I mean that student should probably get information about what are our practices and what are the products or that we are using so if the trustees that received the letter or if Dr. Rod Rodriguez did they could forward that maybe to Dr. Rodriguez and yeah, can follow I up will. with that student um, so uh, for me, um, I have a couple or a question on page nine under school health and safety uh, regarding counseling, psychological, and social services. Is that new ed code or is that local policy? So I mean, I, I like it. Let me, let me just preface that with that we shall partner with programs to provide counseling services to students. All schools shall provide professionals qualified to provide student counseling services to promote social and emotional well-being 
also, um, I wouldn't be able to speak to anything really uh, far outside of what's required in the wellness policy and what regulations pertain to nutrition uh, services, nutrition meals, and, and the required um, language. However, uh, part of the reason that the, this section was added is that in the rules for creating a uh, local school wellness policy, it, uh, we are required to incorporate what they say is eight components of school health. So um, what goes into the wellness policy is more than cupcakes at a party. It's, um, it's eight different components thinking about student wellness overall, right? So um, uh, how they, you know, s you know s safe streets, um, uh, clean cl you know, classrooms, and, and it's all of that and not just kind of food related. And so uh, there was discussion from the coordinated school health group about somehow making sure that all eight components had language within the document to kind of highlight um, all, you know, this overall, you know, well-rounded um, wellness okay. idea. So th that's Mark where the language was added from. And we did have uh, directors from, you know, each of those topics um, uh, add that language. Okay. Is that the, um, the counseling, is, um, who can answer that more clear? Because I understand that's, not it's one of the eight components, so we added the counseling because we provide those services in the district. So when working with the Consolidated Health Committee, we have representatives from PVPSA. We brought in social-emotional counselors, so they asked us to add that as part of our policy so that it's an overall encompassing plan that's more, as she spoke to, than just changing the food rules every three years, but incorporating the physical aspects, the physical activity in PE, nutrition in general, and part of it was counseling services, so we added that language to our policy, which we're allowed to do. Right, so I understand that, but my question was, and I guess you're answering it in a roundabout way, that's a local policy. It's not ed code that says we have to put that in there. It, I would love it to be our policy because I support There's no that. specific thing around health and safety that it dictates you need to have that section, mm -hmm. but what we construct in that section would be up to local control. Thank you. Oh, I was just going to ask. Okay. So yes. if we have uh, one more question, then we're, we're going to have to move forward because we do have much more to do and our, I'm sorry? Billy's one something, oh. Maria and me. But you can go I'm after, yes, okay. our final comments. Okay. I'm not saying you can't speak. Oh, okay. <laughs> First. So I just want, yeah, and, and where it says here that um, health education curriculum should include a variety of topics such as personal health, family health, community health, consumer health, environmental health, sexuality, education, mental and emotional health, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, so that has all that kind of stuff in there as far as it says that the curriculum should have that kind of stuff in it. Yes, and that, that comes out of ed code. That's what we have to cover in health classes, and that is specified in ed code. So those, oh, we put that code. into the plan so students get that during their health education. Okay, so all that's in there. Okay. Thank you. A lot of my questions were already answered, and there's this whole thing on professional development and PE, which I was curious about. I was hoping that our um, elementary teachers were getting professional development in PE so they know how to keep their kids active. One of the things I've long been concerned about, both as a board member but mostly as a parent, is that we had cut back recess hours. I mean hours. <laughs> I wish it were hours, minutes. <laughs> um, at one time, it was probably before Michelle came, and I don't think we've ever put them back in. It says that um, our, our kids should have at least 20 minutes of recess per day, which seems like such a small amount, really, for children. So I'm wondering if somebody could speak to that. So I'll say that we actually have more than most. So most school districts only either have a morning or an afternoon recess. We have both. Um, the reason why generally it's, it's challenging to put additional minutes in there is because that extends the day for everyone. Um, we're required to have so many instructional minutes. Um, I will say that our students definitely receive their PE minutes um, because we've had um, litigation on that. Um, and then they do receive both morning and afternoon recess, which in most school districts that is not the norm. 
So by ed code, they have to have at least 20. Our students in general have 30, if not more. Most of them have 40. Do, does every elementary school have the exact same amount of minutes for their lunch and their recesses? They do not. It's, um, it's, there's a lot of variability in this school district. Most school districts have all your elementary schools have the exact same instructional minutes and pretty close to have the exact same um, sequence. Now we do because of transportation, almost all school districts have some random, you know, some shuffling of start times. Um, but we have a lot more variability than most school districts. Okay, and I, I like that. Um I, I like the language in here about not denying children um, recess based on punishment because kids really need to exercise and there's so much research recently. I just got something yesterday, this big study about when you let kids actually have more recess, they can attend and focus better. So I think we all know that. The one thing I didn't see in here is just some kind of acknowledgement that we should have later start times for our teenage students, um, even though we don't. But it would be nice to acknowledge that that is a known fact that Kids need more sleep, and they do better if they have later start times. Their mental health and their depression actually is alleviated if they can sleep in later. <laughs> so, you, anyway. Something you can't respond that, to. Is no, you don't have to respond, but I'm, I just... It's a transportation issue. <laughs> you so, don't have to thank respond. You. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I uh, think it was uh, two years ago that uh, two of our schools decided to uh, pull out of the... Um, lunch program and went to a private vendor. Do you know if that that is still working? Um, I, as, as far as I know, we feed every school in, at, at PVUSD with the exception of SABA, um, and SABA has never been part of our school pro program as long as I've been here, which is five years. Um, we actually gained um, uh, Watsonville Charter and Lynn Scott in the past few years. So we actually, we actually um, added so schools that they, we're feeding. So they've so returned. under contract with the private anymore. Anymore. Thank you. A well, uh, comment is that if our, if our health insurance premiums are going up 6%, whatever, that's like $2.4 million. One of the things that we're trying now in the, in the private industry is for a corporation to, to put in a very strict wellness plan for everyone not only the students but the but the faculty and so forth to to uh, keep everybody healthy to prevent illnesses uh, you know we're always going to have some of course but uh, keeping everybody as healthy as we can <clears throat> to reduce claims which reduces premiums I don't know if that makes sense the other the other item is that uh, back in um, 19 1990 when we first had the financial crisis the uh, one cut that we made was the laundry service now what does that have to do with uh, fitness well laundry service pro uh, provided the kids with a dry uh, a towel every day which meant that that they showered which meant they exercised when when you take one of those things out it was amazing how taking out the laundry service which uh, saved us a hundred thousand dollars a year reduced the number of kids that actually showered which meant that this whole pe program went to a to a non-sweat program and and so the uh, very thing that we wanted we cut because of that one service so maybe we should look at again bringing back that type of laundry service which would which would help us all this is the institutional <laughs> knowledge that is so great because <laughs> wouldn't have thought about that that's great so, Go ahead. I, I'm not prepared to talk about the laundry service at this moment, but um, but what I am, and you'll be proud of us, what I am prepared to talk about is we are um, going to be a recipient or we are a recipient of a grant through Kaiser Permanente through the Alliances of Healthier Tomorrows in which it is all about not only professional development for our teachers around um, fitness and healthier eating, but it also is a staff 
staff component for staff health and really promoting events um, such as jogathons, 5Ks, those type of things, and other um, challenges, so health challenges, um, which is paid out of this grant, so it's not paid out of the district, um, but really in an effort to promote health and health and wellness of everyone. And so Kaiser Permanente um, tapped us as one of the people, and um, so we just had a meeting with them on Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, I think it was, I can't remember. I think it was, it was Monday. Um, so anyway, so we're working on that. The towels, I'll get back to you. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> okay, Mar Maria. Well, before I go, I do want to make a motion to extend the meeting to 10:45. Okay. Um, we just have after this item the consent agenda and then read out unclosed. So, um, I think that sounds good. So, is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> okay. M motion passes six zero one. Okay, so for me, I just want to highlight um, a change that I really like under the uh, parental support. It's nice to see that we included um, collaboration with community partners and connecting parents to community food, gardening resources, local nonprofits, and providing nutrition education. Now, my question to that is, what are we doing to do that? Oh, could you uh, uh, state the page? I just want to Yeah, it's page 8. And it's B, is the first um, paragraph under parental support. Um, I, I don't have all the resources prepared today, but there's definitely um, um, working with Second Harvest Food Bank, working with Life Lab. There's a lot of uh, nutrition education that's available and provided for parents. Um, there's food that is... Um, food programs that are provided for parents as well. Um, we partner with Second Harvest and the CalFresh, which is food stamps uh, outreach program. When we do meal applications to start the year, we link to them on our website. So um, if you want to have something listed, I can definitely do some more research to see what's happening outside of my department. Um, but I definitely have already attended um, and been able to see a lot of great things by other departments as well. Yeah, so I think there's just a lot of information to cover tonight, to go into much detail, so I would recommend p to bring back and, well actually it's, it's Kim's recommendation, to come back and give a full presentation on food service um, and just a lot, a little bit more time for us to be able to ask questions. Or health. Another point too to speak to that, we also partner with uh, local community nonprofit. We have community gardens at right behind Diamond Tech, Rolling Hills Middle and Pajaro Middle School all have pretty thriving community garden programs that support people growing their own vegetables and that it's grown really well and one at Diamond Tech has grown tremendously. So we'll continue those partnerships as well. Yeah, well, well we have a lot of community garden. We've got Bradcliffe, <coughs> Loney has a big community garden, a lot of community garden. Can okay. I just, yep. think, what? Could I just ask a point of clarification? Would you like just the presentation to focus solely on food services, or would you like to bring back this entire topic and be able to focus additional attention no, to I, the I entire do. document? Not just food, but health. We can't hear you. Karen, can you speak into the microphone? I'm just saying, no, I hope we do it on health, too, just not food but just so the entire presentation with food and time. health food and health yeah I want the towels and the towels <laughs> okay okay all right thank you so much for coming and staying late to um, help us um, understand this and we look forward to hearing more thank you so we'll move on to um, item 11 the consent agenda um, is there a motion to approve? Move I approval. Just wanna, uh, I'm, I'm calling for a motion. Okay. Are you making a motion? I made the motion. Okay, wait, wait, hold on. So I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay, is there a second? And discussion. Okay, so. Is that how, do I wait now to do the full items? <laughs> you can say that you, you want to pull an item, tell me the item number. Okay. And then I'll ask for a revised motion and second. Okay. Um. 
Well, I was going to just, just a couple questions about migrant programs. Which number is that? Uh, the 11.4. That's speech and debate. Yeah, and then the Leadership Institute. That's mostly. What numbers? Okay, so 11.4 Four and five? Yeah. Okay. So we will defer those items. And then before we take a vote, I just wanted to make mention of uh, the purchase orders. Um, I think that's really important for the public to see. A lot of times when we give our, um, our budget reports, it's a really high level. And this is a really good way to see. I mean, looking at this one for this month, it's a really good way to see where our money is going. It's going into the classrooms, it's going into facilities, it's going into furniture replacement, and it, it's going where our students, staff, and families have asked us to put our money, and that's proof of it. So if anyone's interested in reading a very long, what seems like a dry report is actually really exciting to see the good things that's happening. So with that, I will ask for a vote on the consent agenda with items 11.4 and 5 deferred. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Um, item 11.4. Go ahead, Karen. Come here. Come up here. <laughs> what was your question on 11.4, Karen? Okay, well, I'll, I'll ask him. Um, but I'm just so impressed that you have about five things for migrant students during the summer, five different programs that are migrant students are all going to. I was going to ask you a couple of things. How do you figure out which migrant students go to which incredible programs? I, I, the My National one, I know that they do that one. The yeah, specific one about, you, you were talking about the speech and debate? I'm, uh, so I, I did we're the first one two. We're on speech and debate right now. Um, I just, the speech and debate tournament um, is, so the students are selected to go and we won sometimes? Have we the, uh, um, this is a, uh, it's a state level competition. It's uh, <laughs> set up by the uh, uh, California Department of Education migrant program. Uh, it happens every year during the week of uh, May 5th. Actually, it already happened uh, uh, last week. Oh. Uh, we took 28 students. Uh, they're selected. Uh, uh -huh, 28. They were selected uh -huh. um, throughout the year. Um, there were some coaches that the, uh, trained some of the students. Um, 34 students were selected, only 28 ended, uh, ended up going. Um, it's during the weekend. Um, there's the um, four um, teams uh, for the uh, debate, uh, two middle school and two high school. Uh, the middle school is composed of one Spanish debate team and one English debate team. High school is the same thing, one Spanish and one English. Oh. The all high schools and middle schools were represented. The uh, um, uh, in the speech uh, format, there's two per grade level, uh, two in sits all the way through uh, 12th grade, and one in Spanish and one in English. Um, the uh, uh, in terms of the competition, the uh, um, the um, in terms of speech, uh, uh, senior from uh, PV High placed second place in the debate Spanish uh, competition. Wow. In terms of the uh, debate, um, the middle school level, um, they were from uh, four kids from Rolling Hills and one from Pajaro Middle School. They took first place in the uh, debate competition at the state level. Debate, and wow. Yes, that and good. so the, uh, they were amazing. Um, wow. I thought the high school level should have placed, but the, uh, it, it we're brand new in, in this competition. Uh, we're lacking coaches, the, um, and, and I went to their presentations, their debate. And I feel like they won uh, their uh, competitions, but there were some uh, issues in regards to the um, protocols that were not followed in regards to our team. They lost points, and they, that's the reason why they didn't play. So we're trying to kind of uh, get a coach that actually, actually not a coach, but a um, um, coordinator that actually can coordinate all the middle schools and high school and be able to get all the necessary coaches to get our team better prepared. The, uh, our kids were amazing. They did uh, really well. They behaved really well. They represented PVUSD in, uh, in Netslin matter. So we're happy to let you know that we did bring a uh, first place in the middle school debate competition in the Spanish <laughs> section of it. So. <laughs> Willie had a comment too. Um, yes, the um, migrant uh, banquet is 
Saturday. Just, yes. Just Saturday. So I just wanted to help and make that announcement. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the uh, banquet, of course, will serve um, non-fat foods. Bill <laughs> 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 uh, <Gilgogi> salad. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> okay. We just did the well. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it's all at Lakeview this year, not at Mellow and the Lakeview. Yes, it's all at Lakeview. Lakeview. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. To kill the calories. Okay. So 11.5? Well, 11.5. Okay. I just want to ask you, so the, so they go to the L.A. area for the Leadership Institute, mm -hmm. right? Because they're going to the Channel Islands. They go to the Channel Islands. So are they, are they, are they, are they connected to UCLA? No. Or? No, no. It's the, it used to be many, many years ago, it used to be a C, uh, UCLA program. Uh, they moved it away many years back. Uh, they, they took it over to um, um, uh, Channel Island. Actually, took it over. Uh, and but what's the university that they work uh, with? Channel Islands. There's a university a CSU. there. Mm -hmm. CSU Channel Islands. Mm -hmm. well, I'll be darned. <laughs> I didn't even know that the CSU at Channel <coughs> Islands. Okay, so that's the university that they work with when they do the leadership institute. That's where they are. All right, thanks. And and if you and they're selected, uh, all three comprehensive high schools uh, get to pick. Uh, we get ten slots. The uh, we don't pay for any of that. It's paid by the uh, state of California migrant education. So who who selects the students? The uh, counselors, the migrant counselors at the high school okay. level. So the uh, there's a process. There's an application. Um, the um, high school, the old three high schools are represented, and, and it's based on numbers. What Somo High has, has the largest number of migrant students, so they get five slots. P High has uh, a three, and and Aptos High has two. Okay, five, three, and two. Okay. okay, are there any other questions on this item? Those are awesome, and I also noticed we didn't pull it, but. Um, the summer program at Cabrillo is on there, and yes, I, as and, you know, and, I got. And if you know, uh, if you notice that the, we we're adding one more, and that's uh, working with uh, Gene in regards to the uh, uh, middle school uh, girls in engineering mm -hmm. and boys in engineering, mm -hmm. and it's all uh, provided by Cabrillo. They provide the uh, professors, the uh, the uh, curriculum, and the space, uh, which is paid for for the. Uh, Whatever There's they, an they engineering and transportation or something. Transportation right? is you know yeah. it's it's in the Watsonville Center, so they don't we don't pay for that. That's it's walking. Well, great, it's great that um, all this great work is being done every year, and thank you so much for your leadership on that. Okay, so um, we um, I'm looking for a motion for item eleven point four. I'll make a motion. Well, or I'll second. Okay, she pulled him, so I'll give her the. The motion and you the second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion, motion passes uh, unanimously. And I'm looking for a motion on item 11.5. Make a motion on 11.5. Second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to move to. Um, Closed session items, item 13, or actually 14. Closed session, reconvene if necessary, and we do not have to. So item 14 is action on closed session. And we're going to start with expulsions and Trustee Osmondson. I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of 2017-2018 school year and the fall semester of 2018-2019 school year um, for 17-18-036. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of 2017-2018 school year and the fall semester of 2018-2019 school year. Um, with the placement at the same school, okay. For 17-18-037. Um, okay, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of 2017-2018 year and the fall semester of 2018-2019 school year. 
placement at another school for 1718038. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, thank you, Karen. And um, now for the rest of our closed items, Trustee Orozco. Under item 2.2, I move to approve the district administration. I'm sorry, I move to approve the certificated re personnel report as presented by the district administration with the addition of wet administrative appointment, three new hires and three separations. Is there a second? Second. Trustee Ursino, second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district's administration with the addition of one new provisionary hire, one separation, and one separation from service. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. That was second by Kim. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Under 2.6, the board approve a worker's compensation claim settlement. Um, for authority claim number 81060100037. And under item 2.7, the board approve an MOU with Live Oak School District with PVUSD for one special education student. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and um, upcoming board meetings uh, is May 23rd is the next meeting and it will be held here and just as a reminder, the employee celebration will be held at the district office boardroom at 3.30. And then um, closed session will be here at 6 and open session at 7. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a good evening.